Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the February 13th meeting of the Glendale City Council. May we have a roll call, please? Council Member Zagajanian. Present. Devine. Here. Najarian. Here. Sinanian. Here. Mayor Garpedian. Here. Black salute. Council Member Sinanian, would you lead us in the black salute? Please join me in pledging allegiance to the flag of our nation. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for the invocation. John Quincy Adams, sixth president of our United States and son of founding father and President John Adams, described the characteristics of leadership as follows. If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. This evening, we pray for our city's leader, not only those in these chambers, but throughout our city, for every person who inspires, dreams, learns, and does more to help others become more and to do better for all who live and work in our city. Let us pray that our citizens are inspired by these decisions and actions of our council. We pray for the continued prosperity and vitality of our great city and for all those who call it home. We also pray for their brave sons and daughters who serve in our nation's armed forces and for all who await their safe return home. We pray for all this and peace tonight and always. Amen. Amen. Maybe please have your report. The agenda for the February 13, 2018 regular meeting of the Glendale City Council was posted on Friday, February 9, 2018 on the bulletin board outside City Hall. And what's next, please? Presentation and appointments at 3A is agenda preview for the meetings of Tuesday, February 20th, 2018. Mr. Todd Kalyan. Thank you, Mayor Garpet and members of the City Council. Next week's meetings will start with the Glendale Housing Authority meeting in the afternoon at 3. There's only one item, that's the approval of minutes on that agenda. That will immediately be followed by a joint meeting of the Housing Authority and City Council. Again, there's one item from Community Development, and that's the execution of an affordable housing agreement and an agreement to lease real property for a proposed affordable senior housing project at 5th Street and Sonora. After that meeting, we'll have a special meeting of the City Council again in the afternoon. One report uh, from Director of Community Development regarding intention to suspend activities and not levy assessments within the Adams Square Business Improvement District. The City Council meeting in the evening has a number of consent items. At 4B is a report from Public Works regarding the household bulky and abandoned item collection services. The next four meetings are from Glendale Water and Power. The first is a report amending the city's existing agreement with CDM Constructors, Inc. for the operation and engineering services for Glendale Operable Unit for an additional five-year term. That'll be followed by another report regarding the master services agreement with advanced control systems for the electric SCADA system, followed by yet another report for awarding a contract for the pump replacements at Glen Oaks 968 pump station, and a final report from Glendale Water and Powers regarding the novation of an existing nine and a half year Western Systems Power Pool Power Purchase Agreement to BP Energy Company. Final report under consent is from the Interim Chief of Police regarding recommendation to amend the Professional Services Agreement with Ron Smith for Forensic Services. Um, under action items, uh, the Fire Chief will uh, propose the Fire Recruit Academy for fiscal year 2018. Uh, as well as provide a report on the purchase of an air compressor for Fire Station 21 as a sole source purchase. Um, at 8C is a report from Water and Power regarding a wireless communication facility lease agreement for property that the city owns at 807 Airway. And the final report that evening will be from the Director of Community Development regarding a variance for floor area ratio, parking exception, and combined stage one and two design review for the proposed development of a hotel on city-owned property located at 241 North Maryland Avenue. Thank you, Mr. Hockley. What's next, please? 3B is a proclamation designating February 2018 as Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. Okay. Uh, the proclamation, I believe Tara Peterson's here from the YWCA. Tara? Welcome. First of all, I just want to thank um, the City Council and for um, recognizing uh, February as Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. Um, one in three adolescents experience um, dating abuse each year. And according to a survey conducted by the California Healthy Kids in 2013, 46% of seventh graders reported having a girlfriend or a boyfriend, and 8% of those students reported experiencing physical violence from their girlfriend or boyfriend. 
by ninth grade, 50% of the students report having a girlfriend or boyfriend, and 10% of those students experience physical violence. These numbers increase even further by the 11th grade with 56% of the students reporting having a girlfriend or boyfriend and 13% of those students experiencing physical dating abuse. And so we think this matter is extremely important to our community and we're excited that we'll be partnering um, with the Glendale Unified School District and a local um, mentoring program, Generation Next, to be doing some teen dating violence awareness activities. And I just want to share um, a little bit about what we're doing. We're launching a, <coughs> excuse me, an educational poster campaign with the city um, Glendale Unified School District. And the campaign encourages students to ask what makes a healthy relationship. And those answers include speaking up, communicating honestly, respecting each other, creating healthy boundaries, and respecting each other's privacy. In addition, on March 8, 2018, students from the Glendale Unified School District will be given the opportunity to explore healthy relationships and become a healthy relationship ambassador under the um, facilitation of our YWCA Domestic Violence Prevention Program staff. This half-day workshop will be hosted by YWCA Glendale and ABGU's Next Generation Next Mentorship Program, and we'll be bringing six local high schools to discuss behaviors that range from healthy, unhealthy, to abusive. And we think it's critical that um, teens are, um, that have may be experiencing domestic violence are aware of the services that are offered, and we want folks to know that if they are experiencing um, any type of teen dating violence, they can call our domestic violence hotline at 888-999-7511 where we can provide confidential support. They can also con call anonymously as, as well. So we just want to thank you again so much for taking this step and recognizing February as Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. Excuse um, me, can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat the phone number? Yes, I'll repeat the phone number. The phone number is 888-999-7511. It's 24 hours, seven days a week. Well, uh, thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for the great work that you, our, you do in our community. This is a, a very important issue, especially when some parents do not believe that uh, this kind of violence happens. And if your parents don't believe you, you have a huge, huge issue on your hand as a teenager. So I think it's a, it's a, a great issue that we have to address. I want to thank you for uh, your, your work, uh, not just on this issue, Overall, the work that you do in our community. And I have a proclamation. Uh, it is a long one, but I'm going to try to read it with one breath. So, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> whereas uh, females between the ages of 16 to 24 are more vulnerable to intimate partner violence, experiencing abuse as a rate almost triple the national average, and one in three adolescent girls in the United States is a victim of physical, emotional, or verbal abuse from a dating partner a figure that far exceeds victimization rates for other types of violence affecting youth. And whereas high school students who experience physical violence in a dating relationship are more likely to use drugs and alcohol, are at a greater risk of suicide, and are much more likely to carry patterns of abuse into future relationships. And whereas nearly half of teens who experience dating violence reported that incidents of abuse took place in a school building or a school grounds, and only 33% of teens who are in an abusive relationship ever tell anyone about the abuse. And 81% of parents surveyed either believe teen dating violence is not an issue or admit they do not know if it is one. And whereas by providing young people with education about healthy relationships and by changing attitudes that support violence, we recognize that dating violence can be prevented, and whereas it is essential to raise community awareness and, and provide training for teachers, counselors, and school staff so that they may recognize with youth are ex exhibiting signs of dating violence, and whereas the establishment of teen dating violence awareness and prevention month will be benefit young people, their families, schools, and communities, regardless of socioeconomic status, gender, sexual orientation, or ethnicity. And whereas everyone has the right to a safe and healthy relationship and to be free from abuse. Now, therefore, I, Vartang Arpetian, Mayor of Glendale, do her hereby proclaim February 2018 Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month throughout Glendale. With that. Thank you so much.
If I, if I may, um, Tara, I want, want to make one more comment, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. 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 Um, I just wanted to <coughs> mention that one of my proudest accomplishments uh, when I was on the Commission on the Status of Women and working with the Domestic Violence Task Force here in Glendale, and of course the YWCA was a part of that task force, and we were able to get uh, a curriculum in the ninth grade uh, in all of our GUSD schools uh, about safe dating, uh, what is acceptable behavior, what is an acceptable relationship. And uh, that was six to eight years ago, so it is still going on, and I'm very proud of that. And uh, it's a very, very important uh, program, and I'm so glad that you're taking it to a new level. And uh, good luck, and uh, I know it will be well received. Thank you so Great. much. Thank you, and thank you all so much on behalf of YWCA Glendale and our board of directors and all of the women and children and families that we serve. Thank you. Thank you. What's next, please? Next is a consent items including minutes following a routine and may be acted upon by one motion. Any member of council or the audience requesting separate consideration may do so by making such request for a motion as proposed. Okay. I'll move Any the item. Second. Roll call, please. Council members Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sunanian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes. Next item, please. Next item is city council and staff comments. I would like to go to council member Devine first. Okay. Um, today, uh, we experienced in my neighborhood a electrical outage. Everything went dark. Uh, so that gave me uh, new respect for Grayson. However, uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is because our GWP staff was on the spot before we knew it. Uh, they had it located, the outage located, the, uh, the, you know, they defined it and they had to put in a new um, transformer, which took them some time, but power was uh, put back, given back to us, restored in about two hours. So I went out on my street, took this picture of the guys, and uh, you know what I didn't realize is this is risky business. This is not, uh, I mean, they can get hurt doing this. Uh, so uh, kudos to all of them. Thank you, Mr. Zern, for uh, this great staff. Thanks to all those guys that were out there this morning. Uh, as I say, LA might have taken two days. You got, the guys had it done in two hours. So thank you so much. We're very appreciative. I just want to know if you paid your IBEW dues <laughs> uh, before you started I running out that transformer. <laughs> We've got strict, strict I, uh, memos of understanding for that. They stuff. made they made very sure I didn't fall into that deep <laughs> hole. I have to tell you that I did not do a thing. <laughs> did not do a thing, but okay. thanks to everybody. Uh, the other um, thing I wanted to mention was that uh, I attended on Sunday with um, Council Member Sinani and uh, a report, uh, a program that was sponsored by uh, Senator Portantino on the status of women in Armenia. And uh, it was uh, very, very interesting. Uh, uh, the, one of the speakers was Maro Matosian, who is the Executive Director of the Women's Support Center in Yerevan. Uh, I and the audience were encouraged by the progress being made in Armenia in support of victims of domestic violence, progress in education, in awareness, and in support systems given to these, uh, available to the women. Uh, they are even attacking uh, the legislation front and getting legislation passed. They haven't gotten as far as penalties, but they're working on it. But it is a, was a true example, and I was so uh, moved by this, the uh, importance and the power of women bonding together for a cause and how they can inspire and, and um, uh, bring about change, not only in how people react and are aware, but how laws can come into existence. So uh, they have, they've made progress, they have a ways to go, but they are working very hard at that, and I know Mr. Sinanian will probably add to that, but it was uh, uh, quite a good conversation, and I thank uh, Senator Portantino for bringing that uh, um, program to our community. Uh, I have two other, uh, one is on um, uh, requests, and I'm gonna ask my colleagues for some help on these. Uh, while we're waiting to receive the final Grayson uh, EIR, uh, 
which is going to let us evaluate the alternatives that, uh, that we have for the power plant. I'm asking for a second from one of you to, as a request uh, to staff uh, to bring back uh, in the next two weeks a report to council for discussion regarding the hiring of an independent consultant or engineer to make a study of the current condition of Grayson. You know, it's our responsibility to keep the electricity on, and I know we have staff that will do that, but in the interim, uh, the task of the consultant would be to give council an estimate of the type and the scope of repairs and estimate a cost of these repairs in order to extend the life of Grayson and keep it running for at least the next five or six years while we are doing uh, the sort of repowering that we finally decide to do. So I'm asking my colleagues if anyone would, uh, would second that, uh, that request of staff. I second. Second. So, um, Hopefully that um, study can be brought back. Is that not contained in the EIR, the condition of the plant, or is it the fact that it's not independent? I'm not sure what the thrust of the uh, request is. The, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, the EIR has alternatives associated with, uh, with the EIR, as, as you all know, and we're going to get into quite a bit of detail as it relates to all of those al alternatives. Um, I'm not sure that's what the request is, though, um, based on what Council uh, Member Devine has brought up. Right. Um, an independent study, if I understand this co correctly, to be brought back uh, for the Council to discuss to see who we might be able to hire um, to uh, assess the uh, power plant as it is today right. in its current condition um, and uh, provide any sort of feedback to, to Council if we were to have the current grace and remain as is, um, what that would entail, um, and if it's even feasible or possible, um, which we don't think so, but I, you know, we can always bring something back to you to to uh, make a decision whether you want to move forward with an assessment of that nature. We've 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 he we hear that it's it's old and it's it's run down and it's falling apart, but we I'd like to see an exact exact engineering study of where we are and and if we begin to repower or do some work on Grayson um, how long will we be with power how long will Grayson last be up and running the viability I see Mr. Zern walking up I mean I, I think we have enough information as it relates to today and and where Mr. we are Mr. Mayor members of the council I'll, I'll give you the most recent uh, assessment data but there have been that I have found three full engineering studies done within the last, I'm going to say, 10 years. Um, and those are, I mean, they're voluminous. Uh, I gave them to Ms. Godinas in the attorney's office. The stack is about that high. I'd be happy to share those, and I can give you the most recent data on what's been operational, what's not been operational, and what the costs have been for that. Um, we can do another study, certainly, if that's that's your desire. But well, I, I just would like for council maybe to have an opportunity to discuss that if if we think that uh, you know with the figures that you bring in or the studies, if they're ten years old, um, you know, we I think we need to, an exact study of where we are today and where we are going to be, like in a year, while we're discussing and making decisions and perhaps going through with the repowering. So I can certainly. One of the things with a study of that nature, when you're looking at the uh, condition assessment, an older study would mean that it's even worse now than it was five years ago. So I can show you some of those results, give you some current data, because in that short of a period of time, it, it'll take a lot longer to bring somebody on board, retain them, and have to do the report. But in the meantime, I can share with you what we have, uh, and then maybe from there you can you can see if there's specific information or an overall study. But um, each of the condition assessments I have read has progressively gotten worse, but I, I'd be more than happy to share those. Those are public documents. Can we bring that forward within the next couple of weeks as I'll, it relates I'll, to us? Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, Ms. Beers, yeah, I'll put something together and, and give you an estimate of what, what, what that would take. Let, let me ask you, is it, is it possible that um, a company or uh, would have engineers that would be able to come out and do this like gratis for for no charge I my personal opinion Ms. Devine is I highly doubt that would oh, be the case okay. 
I, I haven't been able to get anybody to do anything gratis. Any engineers out there? <laughs> so, and we have had, for instance, individual consent. Uh, Council member. Councilor, I, I know, I know. I, I, know. I knew. We could try. I knew we could find one. I knew we could find one. Well, okay. But we've had a couple of assessments that have been done on specific units, uh, four, five, three, which are which are the ones that are viable, and we can give you the one and two overhaul issues. Well, I. I I just so we think can it's, share that. Okay. I just think it's important that we know where we stand right now, how long this plant is going to be viable looking into the future, and if it's not, what are we looking at as far as cost and repairs as we move forward? Right. Just to keep the electricity on. The other component that I'm going to put back in there, though, is too, as you remember we discussed last week, that it may not be just a mechanical issue. It may be a regulatory issue. Mm, right. As Ultimately. Well. So that yes. may be, our, our fate point. may be decided by that, and I'll just include that that information as well in the overall discussion. But I will get back to, to Ms. Beers on, on a timeline and how, how fast I can get that put together and present that to you. Right. Councilmember Agajana, don't go away, maybe. When, yes, sir. Excuse me. When was the uh, last time that they studied the situation of Grayson? The last one I saw, I believe, was 9, 2009. 2009. Right. But I, I'll go back and look. Like I said, I've seen three uh, done by pretty reputable firms. Black and Veatch, I believe, did one. Um, uh, the the other firm is, I believe, actually, I think, I, I think Pace had some involvement in a previous one as well, uh, making an assessment. And, and maybe in that report, you can bring uh, uh, maybe some uh, idea of what it would cost if we decided to go in that direction. If we were to get a new study, do you agree with that, Mr. What a study would cost? Yes. Sure. Well, I can give you an estimate. Well, can I just ask a quick question? So I'm, I'm trying to understand, what is the purpose of this exercise? Is there a dispute that Grayson is in rough shape and we need to make a decision on it one way or another? Is, is there a dispute as to that? Well, Are we trying to prove that there is or there isn't yeah, one? Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to cut you off, but we, I mean, the request has been made, and okay. I think it, it, we're going to start to get into the discussion if Ms. Devine has to answer that question. Um, uh, unless you can do so very briefly, I really would caution you to, to let's... I, just, we, I yeah. just feel that we need to, we need to, we hear a lot of nebulous, you know, statements. It's old, it's this, it's that, and I think we need an exact, exact engineering a, a analysis of where we are in Grayson right now and how long we have okay. going let forward. Okay, let me just add one more thing. Uh, I think this, the, uh, the, the, the issue of Grayson being old and tired is not a, there's no debate about that. And that's why the city decided to go to this route. But when we say independent study, that's, that's kind of a word that is being thrown around these days. And I want to understand what is the independent study because every time we want to get a study done, we put an RFP out, we get proposals, and this council decides who to go with. Correct. That's independent study, right? That's, is that what you're referring to? Council Member Devine? More or less. Yes. Because if it's an yeah. independent study, we, we put this proposal out, RFP, RFP out, we issue an RFP, and then we get proposals and the council decides. Correct. Where to go. Okay. Correct. Council Member Adjana. I think what uh, Ms. Devine is trying to say, an independent engineer mm -hmm. to review the situation yes. and briefly bring the report. It doesn't take forever and uh, but who, who decides? Of, that's the question. Ms. That's Mayor. the thing that I'm sorry. I, 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 I with all the respect, I think we have a pretty clear direction on what what we okay. need to bring back, and, and we can right. we can have okay. that discussion when okay. we, we talk. I'll bring you what I have, and then you can give me direction at that point in time. Yeah. All right. That's Thank good. You. Thank, right. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Okay. My um, second. I have another. If I if you don't mind. No, not I have at another all. request. We've been made aware of an illegal <laughs> demolition of a dwelling at 1420 Valley View. And because of this blatant disregard for the municipal code, as well as rulings from the commissions and this council, I'm asking for a second from one of my colleagues to request staff to bring a report to council for discussion on what action the city is taking to address the illegal demolition and suggestions on steps that can be taken by council to prevent this type of behavior in the future. If, if I may, um, before that motion is seconded, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, um, that is an item that uh, CDD staff and our staff will be working on. Um, because it could lead to prosecution, I, I 
have to caution you against having discussion about that because it's in the enforcement arm of our city right now. If the council wants to have a discussion about what steps can be done to deter similar conduct in the future, it's certainly appropriate a course of conversation for the council. But not case specific. Correct. Well, that, that's what I would like. Okay. I would like okay. for that to that in, uh, ordinance to come back and let's look at what the penalties are for this sort of uh, action. That can be done. Okay. Is there a Is second, there a for, second that? for that? Yeah. I'm not really sure what this we want to do. Discussion of the penalties for demolishing no, a building. They're working on it, in my no. opinion. We better, they are. We're, we're working on that particular. We're right? working on that particular case, and I think. Let's wait. Just, just on that, we can do this for the city, but we can't mention that case. Correct. Correct, and I think, and w what I'm hearing, uh, Councilmember Devine, is a request to look at what does our ordinance, current ordinance require, and are there any additional enhancements that should be. Uh, Put into the put into the code, exactly. and that that's yeah. certainly within council's discretion. For illegal discretion. demolition, correct. Yeah, I'll correct. second that. It's not a problem. Yeah. We, can, we can look into that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Any any other comments? Sure. Make some comments. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think Council Member Devine gave a pretty good report on the on Senator Portantino's status of women in Armenia um, talk. It was indeed very enlightening and reassuring and at the same time worrisome but um, thank you for everyone who got up at two o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday and there were actually a lot of people there and a lot of people couldn't make it because there was no parking um, uh, so thanks for coming and showing your interest and your support uh, last Tuesday the Wednesday Tuesday we had a uh, an event in Montrose called Meet Me in Montrose. Did we talk about that last week? No, we didn't. No. And I believe all of us were there. Uh, yes, and uh, it was the beginning of a marketing effort by the um, uh, by the Montrose Shopping Park Association, Montrose Verdugo Chamber of Commerce, City of Glendale, and meant to you know, give a little more impetus to um, the business in Montrose. Great event, great turnout, very promising, and Somewhat part of that on Thursday evening, um, Councilmember Devine was there, and Councilmember Nigerian was there also. We attended the uh, champagne and tea evening uh, at the uh, tea room in Montrose. Again, great turnout, um, very very promising uh, for what's you know what's in the future for Montrose, and that was organized by the Montrose Shopping Park Association. Um, and last Friday night, I attended the uh, Armenian Relief Society's Western USA's Gala, which was unfortunately not held in Glendale, but um, that organization is heavily Glendale-centric. And it was a wonderful event, again, honoring uh, a female organization that plays a, a great social services role um, in this community and beyond. That's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Sinanian. Councilman Ajayan? None? Councilman Ajayan. I just want to briefly touch Grayson again, and I'm hoping that we will consider and people will think about to have Grayson part of it gas and part of it renewable energy uh, because we went so far in it. So I want to see that people, they will study, they will look into it just being against any gas units, gas turbines, I think will be very costly. And I don't want to see all gas turbines there. So my suggestion will be to look into it that to have a system which is part gas and part renewable energy rather than one of the other. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I have a few speaker cards. Uh, Roberta Metford, followed by Frank Gallo. And uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, this is for the community event announcement portion item six. Hi, I'm here to make a community event announcement, um, rather impromptu, but um, 
uh, the city will be celebrating Arbor Day on Tuesday, March 6th at 10 a.m. at the uh, Casa Dobe de uh, San Rafael, which is at 1330 Dorothy Drive in Glendale. Um, I know that um, Mayor uh, Garpedian is going to be there to uh, deliver a message from the city and the nice proclamation. I hope um, many and all, all of the rest of uh, city um, council and uh, staff can uh, be there also. Um, the um, important date, however, um, is the deadline for tree donations, which is two weeks from tomorrow on February 28th. And um, Glendale Beautiful has gotten very modern. We have a lovely web page, and that is all you have to do to get the form to uh, donate a tree, or you can uh, donate online right there at glendalebeautiful.org. So one word, glendalebeautiful.org, and you will be on our uh, nonprofit's webpage where you can find the form um, to donate. Um, I think that's it. March 6th is um, Arbor Day observance, and February 28th is the deadline for donating trees. We do have a very able um, young man who is the chair of Arbor Day, but he has a day job. Uh, so um, Chris Chorbanian um, will probably be here at a later meeting to make a repeat announcement, but I'm here representing the board right now. So be sure and go to glendalebeautiful.org and uh, do, uh, either donate online or download the form and uh, mail it in with your check as usual. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, don't, don't, don't go away. Uh, sorry? Hi. Hello. So just wanted to say, no, don't go away, Roberta. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, I didn't hear Oh, it's you. okay. So two days ago, I received the photos of the trees donated last year. Yes. With, you know. Yeah, from community services and nice. parks. Yeah. Yes, those those were the 2017 trees. Exactly. So I just wanted to say that, you know, folks, yes. when you donate, your, you, you donate a tree, you actually end up having a tree. You know, if you donate in someone's honor, in someone's memory. Right. It's nice. There's a physical manifestation. You're actually it's creating green uh, greenery in the city of Glendale and honoring their memory or, or honoring their existence. It's it's a, it's actually a very beautiful concept. So I want to encourage everyone to participate this year. And I should mention that the Arbor Day celebration is um, arranged by Glendale Beautiful, but in cooperation with community services and parks. And I'm I'm glad you brought up the tree letters because you'll notice they were much enhanced. Um, yes, they're like so many people in the city, they are doing more with less. And uh, they sent a nice picture of the tree and the location so that people can go and have, um, you know, take their picture with the tree, um, gather the honorees, gather people that remember the, um, the, de the departed, if that's the case of the tree. Right. So um, thank you very much to Community in, in Services and Parks. In my case, it was, it was my children, my four kids. So I'm, I'm literally can, this weekend, I'm going to take them up there. Yes. to the uh, Brent summer camp area and have them look at their own trees. And I hope that they keep revisiting their trees and caring for it. And yes, I, I think, I hope people continue to have nice gatherings at their trees, even even though the um, they're not doing a, an official picture right. with the uh, city arborist. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Frank Gallo, followed by Sean Bursell. Frank Gallo, uh, Glendale Coalition for Better Government. Last week, uh, Mr. Cern indicated that uh, the upgrade of the Grayson Power Plan will not result in increased electric rates. Uh, the reasons given were related to reduced reserve requirements and to reduce production costs. In regards to the reduced reserves requirements, I don't see how that will come into play. No money from the reserves, as far as I know, is being used to finance the new plant. If there was money put aside as reserves, how come we are not using that money to pay for the new equipment? In regards to the new uh, or reduced production cost, I would like to see the cost of service analysis, the COSA for the new project. 
assuming that interest rates stay at about 4%, what the city got the last time that it put a bond out, 4% of $500 million is $20 million, just in interest alone. If we add to that the amortization cost, another $8 million a year, so that those bonds are paid off in 30 years, you are looking at $28 million a year. Last year, the utility sold $218 million in electric and electricity. $28 million out of $218 million is 13%. So that would mean that the cost of the utility will increase 13% with a $500 million, million dollar bond. I would like to see the cost up because I don't believe that a 13% increase in cost is going to be easily upset by the new equipment. Maybe it will, but definitely I would like to see the cost of service analysis. Thank you. Thank you. Sean Bursell, followed by Bruce Merritt. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sean Bursell, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the Glendale Historical Society to um, express our extreme dismay and outrage over the unpermitted demolition of a rare and relatively intact 1908 Craftsman House at uh, 1420 Valley View, which was done in flagrant disregard of the specific directive of this city council. And I appreciate uh, council member uh, Devine bringing it up and asking um, staff to, to look into uh, uh, the situation. Uh, just to briefly, as way of background, in 2016, the owner applied for a demolition permit. Staff uh, recommended that it be denied uh, because the, uh, the house was uh, likely a historic resource, and under the California Environmental Quality Act, uh, you have to do a, an environmental impact report before a demolition permit can be issued. And so the uh, director of community development uh, accordingly denied the permit request the owner then appealed to this city council, and in November 2016, this city council upheld the staff determination. They found that there was substantial evidence that the house was, in fact, a historic resource, and therefore, an environmental impact report was uh, required uh, before any <coughs> demolition permit could be issued. Suddenly, on or about February 2nd of this year, the house was demolished without the required EIR and demolition permit. It is the opinion of TGHS that the property owner's demolition of this house was both willful and egregious. It was done without a permit. It was done in contravention of the California Environmental Quality Act and the Glendale Municipal Code. And it was done despite the fact that this city council had determined that an EIR must be prepared before a demolition permit for the house could be issued. TGHS hopes you share our dismay and our outrage over this rebuff of the rule of law and the authority of this council. And if the city agrees with us, and, and you, you have your city attorney looking into it, uh, if, if the city agrees with us that a willful and egregious violation of, of uh, the municipal code has occurred, the owner should be held to the strictest account, potentially including criminal charges pursuant to the Glendale Municipal Code. If this flouting of the city council, city staff, and the building and safety code is allowed to go unpunished, we will see more of this. We will see more unpermitted uh, demolitions. We need to remember what we tolerate, we encourage. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, Bruce Merritt, followed by Violet Sacre. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the city council. Uh, my name is Bruce Merritt. I'm also speaking on behalf of the Glendale Historical Society. This issue that uh, Mr. Bursell just talked about is of such importance, we feel, that it takes more than three minutes to really fully uh, state our position. So I'm going to kind of be the second part of our presentation. And I'm going to talk about the issue of penalty. It's fairly clear what the uh, homeowner in this case did. He looked at what the cost of of uh, obeying the law is, which was basically preparing an EIR. He looked at what the cost of uh, violating the law would be, which we believe is simply a civil penalty of $1,000. And he made the economically rational choice that it makes more sense economically to violate the law than it does to follow the law. 
So this is a very cynical and a very dangerous point of view, and that's why I think the city needs to take it very seriously. We don't have the expertise of Mr. Garcia on what the, the law actually says, but we've looked into it, and it appears that the only civil penalty that he will have for demolishing a building without a permit is to pay a $1,000 fine. And so it's pretty clear that in today's world, it makes a lot more sense to break the law, pay the fine, and do what you want to do than to obey the law. And this is not an acceptable situation. Now, it would be nice if we could come in and say, fine him $100,000 or $500,000, something that would be a deterrent, but I don't think that that's a possibility. It would be nice to be able to come in and say, tell him he can't develop this property for five years or 10 years. That would be a deterrent, but I don't think that's a possibility. We'd like to come in and say, find this contractor who comes in on a weekend uh, without a, a permit and demolishes a house, probably knew something was not uh, legal about that, or bar him from ever doing business in, in Glendale. That would, those would be great remedies. Those would be deterrents. But as far as we know, those aren't available. And we humbly and respectfully ask that the city take a look at whether or not a revised set of penalties might be a better way of dealing with this situation in the future. Let me also say, though, um, I, uh, th that, that this action is, in addition to whatever the civil penalties may be, it's a criminal matter. It's a misdemeanor. And we would urge the city to take make serious consideration of bringing prosecution. I was a former prosecutor. I was for a number of years an assistant US attorney. I have declined cases. I know that not all offenses are prosecuted. But usually the ones that are not prosecuted are inconsequential, uh, technical violations. A demolition of a house is not inconsequential or, or, or technical. This house probably had lead paint. It very likely had asbestos. Where is that lead and asbestos now? Is it in the air? Is it in the runoff from the rain? Is it, uh, is it uh, in the soil? Um, we hope that the city will take action that will vindicate the rule of law in Glendale. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Violet Sacre, followed by Michael Feinstein, followed by Mike Mohi. Hello. Um, my name is Violet Sacre. Um, I'm here to talk about the Grayson conversation we had last week. Um, I thank you for taking my comments so early in the meeting because I have to run. I have a small child. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Council Member Sinanian for your vote last week and supporting us for an independent study of Grayson. Um, I still don't understand why we have to wait till the end of March in order to start one. Um, also, I, want, I appreciate the comments about the lithium ion concerns for storage. Um, I thought the videos were a little bit misleading. However, I really appreciate the concerns, and hopefully that means that Council would consider working with companies who pledge um, humane and ethical mining practices when we decide to go with renewables. Um, we are also sorry that you felt offended by the gathering and the imagery that was used by the coalition. In no way was this meant to be offensive. We're here to work with you. Um, we hope that in a democracy you would actually value peaceful um, engagement from your constituents and for us to voice our concerns. Um, because this matter, matter, this matter matters to us a lot. <laughs> um, we all appreciate re reliable sources of energy. We totally understand that gas is going to be part of it. Um, we all want the lights to stay on and we all appreciate the work that GWP does. We just want to have the most inspired and visionary energy plan uh, with an eye to the future that is sustainable and the cleanest possible that we can have. So thank you so much for continuing the, discussing the process, not closing the, you know, the chapter. And I hope, I hope that you see the value in us being engaged and being here to support you in making these good decisions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Michael Feinstein, followed by Mike Mohill. Good evening, Michael Feinstein, former mayor and city council member in Santa Monica, co-founder of the Green Party of California, and a 2018 candidate for Secretary of State. I'm campaigning on an issue that would give Glendale residents more voice in the state legislature and the city of Glendale more voice in regional planning issues. And I've got a map there on the uh, screen that talks about this issue. The plan is to have a single unicameral state legislature, 500 seats, 
half of the seats elected from regional multi-county districts by proportional representation, and half the seats elected from smaller single seat districts by ranked choice voting. Why go this route? First, the size of the California legislature hasn't been changed since 1879 when we had 865,000 people. Now we have a million people per state senate district. There's no way with 40 state senate seats and 80 state assembly seats that our legislature can look like the people of California. A larger seat, a larger legislature has to keep up with our population. Second, we're a nation state and a state of regions, yet currently all we do is elect people from individual single seat winner take all districts, when the reality is a lot of our economy, our environment, uh, public policy happens on a regional level, and the state legislature enacts policies that affect how we, re, uh, how we live on a regional level, and yet there isn't a public policy debate on a regional basis. You here in Glendale are part of the Southern California Association of Governments. I served on that as well when I was on uh, San Marco City Council. So what happens when you participate in SCAG is that you're part of that body and then that body has to go ahead and lobby the state legislature. Why not give your residents the opportunity to participate in a regional public policy discussion itself to start with? And that's what this plan would do. Now, proportional representation is an election where if 20% of the people hold a common point of view, they win 20% of the seats. Another 30% has a different point of view, they win 30% of the seats. That way, everybody has a seat at the table of our democracy and we benefit from the wisdom inherent in our society. Our current system eliminates voices rather than increases voices and when you're talking about regional planning in this way, you'd have Democrats, you'd have Republicans, you'd have Greens, you'd have Libertarians, all from the same area bringing in different perspectives. So what I'm hoping actually you will do as a city is to give your staff some direction at some point. I saw how easy it was tonight. Uh, you just need two votes and my council we needed a majority, <laughs> good for you. Um, and to start looking at this issue and how it would actually increase the ability of your constituents to have a greater voice in state affairs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mike Mohill. Good evening, Mayor Garpetti. City Council and viewing audience. Mayor Gapetti, and last week I came before this council showing respect to you, council members, and city staff. I told you in the viewing audience that Councilman Arden Najarian violated the spirit of our new individual campaign limit law of $1,100. As you know, Councilman Najarian colluded with Mr. Timmy Martirosian in Mr. Najarian's 2017 re-election. Together they set up an independent expenditure political action committee with Mr. Marjorie Rosen as the sole donator of $25,000. Mr. Najarian lectured me that before he was elected to council, there were no campaign limits or ethical laws and he was instrumental in having these new laws put into place. What Mr. Najarian and Mr. Marjorie Rosen may have done was legal but together they conspired to kill the spirit of our new campaign limit law. What does that say for future campaign laws? Mr. Nigerian told me that he may not be able to sue me for defamation of character, but that Mr. Marjorie Rosen instead should sue me. Councilman Nigerian, Mr. Marjorie Rosen should be suing you for your unethical behavior. Now you have tarnished Mr. Nigerian's good name in the Armenian American community. Because he could not handle the truth last week, Mr. Nigerian went personal and called me a name that was unbecoming of a public official who sits on council and has the public trust. I was shocked by the language of Councilman Nigerian. Afterwards, I received several phone calls from city staff and other people telling me they were offended as well. Mr. Mayor, when Mr. Nigeria attacked me, I countered him, but with all due respect, I never used foul language, and after a few seconds of bantering with Mr. Nigeria, you told me to stop and sit down. What I also found offensive was our interim city manager, Yasmin Beers, telling me to sit down. As you know, Mayor, 
you are the only person who has the right to tell a speaker to sit down and not our interim city manager or anyone else. Where do we go from here, Mayor Gapedian? Going forward, I do not know what to say or what should I be expected. But a member of the public should always be shown respect, even if one disagrees with council member or the city staff. What happened last week in this council chamber is probably one reason many people would rather stay home than speak their mind before our elected officials. Thank you. Thank you. This, uh, let Mr. Mohill take a seat. But uh, just for the record, I, I had 95 speakers last week. And two weeks before that, we had, I don't know, 30, 40 speakers, gave them enough time, respected all of them to speak. We encourage people to show up to the council. We want to hear from our, our constituents. And Mr. Mohill, uh, last week I referred you nothing but Mr. Mohill. I never, ever said anything foul to you. Uh, but the rule is that when the oral communication is over, the speaker will sit down and not have a debate with the council member and vice versa. But I, I, that's what I was referring to last week and that's what I will refer to in the future. We cannot have this debate and back and forth uh, between public speakers and, and the council members. You can voice your opinion every week, three minutes in the beginning, five minutes at the end of the oral communication, uh, and council members can respond to, to the speakers. But there is no, no debate as it's indicated in the beginning of the, every meeting by our city clerk. So I, I'm gonna leave it at that, and Mr. Najarian, I don't know if you wanna add something to it, yes, or I, just uh, yes, you wanna not say anything maybe. So, no, I know, I get the hint, but, um, I just want to say that um, sometimes it's expected that we have the patience uh, of the divine being uh, when we are continually uh, presented with lies and misstatements by members of the public, in particular Mr. Mohill. Uh, if there was any collusion in the last campaign, it was between the coalition for better government, uh, Mr. Mohill, and two others. Uh, the Coalition for Better Government did open an independent expenditure, so-called. They didn't feel it was necessary to make reports to the Fair Political Practices Commission to <coughs> identify their organization. They didn't want to report to that organization, the Fair Political Practices Committee, how much money they received. And they didn't want to report how that money was spent. There is an ongoing investigation <coughs> against those activities. The activities that Mr. Mulville talked about, uh, his belief that there was anything untoward, uh, were reported to the FPPC, and within five days, they issued a letter indicating that there uh, were no violations, no facts sufficient to support a finding of a violation of the Fair Political Practices Act. Those who are curious, it's right here. Mr. Mohill has a copy, but he doesn't seem to believe that, and he continues on attacking me personally on the dais in his newspaper, let's call it that. Can I call it a rag or am I going too far? Or also on the internet. Um, so the facts are clear. He's trying to spin it and trying to bully a member of this council because he stands up for what's right. Um, he's going to continue to do that and I'm going to continue to respond. But one other item that I forgot to mention last week uh, is that I have called for an ethics officer position to be created in the city of Glendale. So aside from campaign limits, aside from conflict of interest laws and campaign rules, I have also, which were enacted, I have recently asked for an ethics officer position to be created. Uh, we're currently in discussions with the city attorney and the city manager. 
Uh, and that's the way I play. I play things straight. Um, I do, however, have an apology to Mr. Mohill. And if you look at the tapes, um, I got to the point where I talked about him scuttling, and I meant to quote T.S. Eliot at that moment, but I was rather upset, and the words escaped me. So what I did mean to say is that Mr. Mohill leaves like a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floor of silent seas. That's T.S. Eliot for you English majors, uh, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. And that's what I meant to state. And I went another way and I used a, a different analogy which was improper. And this is what I did mean to quote. Uh, T.S. Eliot. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, thank you, <laughs> Mr. Dajari. What's, uh, what's next on the agenda, please? Interaction items, item number 8A is Director of Finance regarding financial status report from uh, December 31st, 2017. 8A1 is a motion to note and file the financial status report for fiscal year 2017, 2018. Uh, second quarter ended December uh, 31st, 2017. And 8A2 is a resolution of appropriation approving $492,611 in adjustments to the adopted fiscal year 2017-18 budget. Ms. Beers? Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, we, hear, we are here before you to uh, bring forward the second quarter financial update, and we do have a resolution of appropriation for $492,611, which uh, our finance director will go into detail about. Um, we'll cover our revenues and resources, our departmental expenditures, <coughs> Uh, talk a little bit about our five-year forecast, which hasn't changed um, from our uh, initial report to you in December, and give you a projected fund balance. And at the end, uh, we will discuss the PERS rate stabilization fund and uh, talk to you about where we are to date as it relates to how that fund is doing, and of course, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it to Bob Elliott. Well, it's that time of year, uh, February rolls around, we uh, do our mid-year update. Um, I wanna thank my staff for all the countless hours that they put in the analysis of this, and I probably don't thank them enough, and they're sitting right there in the front row, so try. Um, so let's uh, jump right into the revenues. Uh, revenues are, are uh, very strong um, through uh, December 31st of this year, uh, trending slightly above uh, what we received last year. Um, we're increasing our revenue estimates by 1.7 million, and I'll sh uh, get into the detail of that, primarily the uh, property tax and sales tax. Um, our property tax assessed valuation went up a little bit over 6% this year, and we're seeing uh, that bump in um, our uh, revenues as we get into the year. So looking at the, at the detail, um, you can see where we're at, and, and again, uh, I say this every year, but it's always good to remind, Everybody, we didn't, our revenues don't come in on a straight line basis. We get a, a big bump of property tax in December, um, and then the next big bump, uh, about 40% each time, is in April. So it, it is skewed throughout the year, uh, unlike expenditures, which are, pr are fairly straight line. Um, keeping in mind on the uh, general fund transfer from the utility, we do that once a year at the end of June, so that's why this amount is um, very low at the, this point in, in time. Um, so our total resources at uh, this point of year is 221 million. That includes some of the use of fund balance that we've gone through and uh, previous adjustments and carryovers, as well as use of our assigned fund balance, um, which is primarily economic development activities, money that were set aside for that. So at this point in the uh, year, we're 33% uh, received on our resources. So. Looking into the uh, expenditure side of the of ledger, uh, expenditures are, are uh, tracking um, below 50%, um, about where we expected them, <clears throat> uh, actually a little bit less than what they were last year at this time. Um, everybody is uh, below the 50% mark outside of uh, the fire department, um, but they had uh, uh, extra costs incurred uh, for the Latuna uh, Canyon fire this year and, and we're actually part of the appropriation um, is for uh, extra costs incurred for them and the police department. 
uh, transfers. Um, we received the, the GSA loan re repayment in one lump sum, so we turn around and do the entire transfer to the lower moderate income housing fund, and that's why that uh, amount is higher than uh, the 50% mark. Uh, again, you can see all the different departments where they're tracking. Again, uh, fire department is uh, slightly over the 50% mark, but again, those were those Tuna Canyon fire costs. In total, we're 47.3% uh, on total expenditures. Um, we are uh, proposing adjustments of $493,000 um, for this uh, point in time through uh, six months. Our updated uh, five-year forecast, we show this every time. We spend a lot of time updating it. Um, as we know, different <coughs> assumptions change. Um, we've tried to focus on um, where we are in our baseline um, in terms of our expenditures uh, here. Um, our revenues are strong. We, we see strong growth in revenues um, through the five years. Um, we look at the... Uh, cost of PERS, which is the, the big cost drivers, you can see where we were and where we're projecting it to be as we go out, and we had a lot of discussions on that with the establishment of the uh, 115 uh, per, st uh, per stabilization trust that we established back in July. How's that doing? It's doing very well, and I'll show you the charts towards towards the end of this. Okay. Um, and and uh, so you can see the, the impact on the fund balance with the adjustments that we've made this year and the setting aside of the 26 and a half million um, that we put into that stabilization fund. And I'll show you the, the performance of that. Overall though, the uh, performance in the five-year forecast, uh, give or take, uh, is still very good. Of course, that's always depending on certain things materializing and, and we talk, and Mike and I talk about that quite often with the, the general fund transfer. So assuming that uh, still, uh, stays put. Um, so we started the year with an $87 million fund balance. Uh, we had the, um, some use of fund balance in the $3 million, um, gave us 84, what we're projecting for the end of June. Um, obviously, we put the $26.5 million aside. Um, we're projecting to be about $58.5 million at the end of the year, uh, which is about 27%. Um, keep in mind, we lowered our uh, target rate to, or uh, floor uh, for uh, reserve to 25%, still with a target of 35%, um, but this remains above that 25%. So the per stabilization, uh, we wanted to report back to you every quarter as this goes through. Um, just a reminder how we um, staged the uh, deposits in three different uh, deposits through uh, August and September of 8.8 8, uh, million. Um, we put it uh, into the moderate portfolio. The expected rate of return for that portfolio is 5%. Um, thus far, just in the few months we've had it in there, it's made 4%. Um, so it's done very well. The income has um, already been about $1.1 million. So as we expect, the, the expected rate of return, uh, if we divide the 5% for the year, is the blue bar we've already um, made um, the tan bar thus far this year. And um, as with everything, in all honesty, as we get the, the next quarter, I'm sure there'll be a dip um, for the uh, market adjustments that uh, happened in uh, January and, and again um, this February. But we think uh, we'll still make that 5%. Cumulatively, this is the way it looks as we build that expected uh, return in the year. We're still ex far exceeding that uh, expectation in terms of the return for that. Again, that money is set aside. Um, we're hoping to have it um, earn interest through the 2024-25 fiscal year, and then we'll start drawing it down as our PERS rates uh, peak um, in that uh, time frame. But we can draw that down at any point in time if necessary. And with that, I'm happy to ans answer any questions you have. Mr. Elliott, not, not a finance person, so if you can explain this to me again. We've already made the 5% uh, that we were projecting for the year? No, no, not quite. We're, we're just on the right trajectory, is that what you're saying? Yeah, we're way ahead of, um, let me get back to the slide. So 
if we divide up the 5% for the entire year, that would be the blue bars uh, cumulatively. Okay. So each month we're um, uh, making the, the uh, tan bar in terms of, of return. So thus far we've exceeded the 5% by quite a bit of what we expect to get every month. So annualized, we've already received 4%. So if you annualize that <clears throat> within the few months that we've had, we probably make 12%. Okay. For the so year, this, so this give way. or take, but we'll see how the year goes and, and, and monitor each quarter. So if the trajectory or the tendency holds, yes, we'll it will end up making 12 instead of the projected five. Give or take, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, any questions? Uh, I have a question about, uh, if I could, about the UUTs. You want to explain the... Uh, there's a $700,000 loss. You want to explain that to? Uh, we do to have a testing? drop in our estimate of UUT, um, and we're sh uh, here. We go right here, 700,000. This is a result of, uh, and our UUT has been very strong. But keep in mind, it's a broad uh, tax on the uh, electricity, telecom, um, and video services. Those services are declining in terms of the um, taxability of those. Um, folks are going to Netflix and Hulu and some of the internet-based TVs, so the tax doesn't apply to those. That's known as over-the-top television. Um, and we've looked at the possibility of uh, changing our ordinance to apply to that. We've, there's been a lot of, uh, uh, Pasadena tried to do it and had a, a big storm of uh, protests, so we kind of backed off that idea. But as we look at our UT, it's strong um, in some areas, but this is tapering off, so we decided to lower the estimate a little bit. And um, <clears throat> can I ask a follow-up sure. to that? Yeah, yeah. So, but even people who are using Netflix or Hulu, they're still relying on the internet, right? Yes, but it doesn't necessarily have to be through uh, the AT&T or uh, uh, cable companies where their bill is bundled and, and it's taxed. So it could be wireless, it could be other forms. Internet? So, yeah. yeah. But, but remember, I mean, if the bill, the UT bill for somebody uses AT&T U-verse for and, and buys a movie, that, that all gets taxed. But if they're using Hulu or something else, then it's not, currently, it's not getting taxed. They're using a different service. That's, that's the difference. So the only piece that would be taxed would be the internet service, which is a much yeah. lower dollar amount which is, I, that, that than was my the question. cable. We should, so we that dollar amount. Internet correct is about you know depending on on the type of service they have anywhere from 20 to 40 dollars a month versus a cable bill where you would have all the channels etc which would be upwards of 200 and some odd dollars a month and so that decrease um, for some folks we are seeing a decrease in in the numbers that we are getting and if I may add um, mr. mayor members of the City Council what we're experiencing now is actually the the market is shifting so um, people are shifting from cable channels to Netflix, um, Hulu, and that's the area that is not taxed right now. So, and I believe there was a, a legislature out there, AB 252, uh, addressing what they call the OTT, over the top um, uh, services that they provide. And I think that's still in transition right now. Um, and we still don't know whether we could tax that or not. And how about the people who have <coughs> direct TV and other satellite services? The, you can't tax them either, the right? satellite nor it is not taxed. So that's, yeah, that's so it's mainly the, the cable. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, cable so that was taxed. Right. Correct. <coughs> Questions? Shift in behavior. Questions? I, well, Any I had questions? a question about yes. uh, the uh, fire, fire expenditures. Um, if uh, Chief Fish is here, um, can you explain about what, how much of this we're going to be reimbursed for <laughs> and? since you're over, over, over the 50 percentile? Absolutely, Mr. <laughs> Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, Council Member Devine, yes, the uh, Latuna fire was something that we had expenditures in uh, staffing to get people to protect our property. We had 450 acres burn in that fire. And this has been an unprecedented year for mutual aid. Uh, I, don't, I don't remember a year where we've had people out so many strike teams out at one time in the months of December and January. Uh, so it's been an unprecedented year. As it relates to the uh, Latuna Canyon fire, we have a FEMA uh, FMAG, which is a fire management assistance grant. We will get 75% of all of our costs 
reimbursed to us through the Latuna Canyon fire. As it relates to mutual aid, when we respond to someone else's property or someone else's city and, and their jurisdiction and we fight fire or uh, also in the case of the Montecito uh, mudslides, we get 100% reimbursement on those costs plus a 12% administration <coughs> fee. So um, as it relates to our 51%, a lot of that will be reimbursed. As, I hope that answers your question. It does, it does. What was the bottom line on our cost for these fires? Was it like 150000 It's going to be about $150,000 by all, uh, is an estimate that we have right now. Which is, which is a pretty uh, fair price to pay for what we saved, what you all saved. Thank you. Thank you. That's one accessory to all. Thank you. <coughs> Councilman Alexander. <laughs> uh, I just have a question from Bob, Mr. Bob Elliott. Uh, on page three, on the chart, which you go further down, it says interfund revenue, and we have a loss of 500, and the right after that, fines and forfeitures. And then we have 100,000 loss. Do I read it right? Yes. So what, the, what was your question again? The, so you're showing was it say we fines have loss. And Two different things. Five hundred uh, and one hundred. The losses. Correct. The five hundred thousand dollar reduction. Um, that's mainly oh, due okay. yeah. to the um, uh, integration with the Tyler Muniz system. So we're going through the process of getting a new financial system, um, and uh, we've already and went live with our. Yeah, correct. We, we, only, we already went live with the uh, payroll and HR services. So due to that, these are the charges that we're reducing because. The, uh, the new system is actually able to charge directly to multiple funds, where before we used to handle it um, internally. So I don't know if but that- the word like fine, it says- fine, Fines and forfeitures is the next one down. Fines and uh, forfeitures. Oh, I'm sorry, fines and forfeitures, that's yeah. due to reduction in traffic fine uh, revenue that we get. And when we looked at the, uh, the police reports, actually the citation that is being issued by the police department, Police department has gone down, so the revenues have gone down also. And so we're we're estimating that we will probably get about hundred thousand less this year. So these citations are like for speeding. And Correct. It's Tra the citations yeah, for tickets. the uh, uh, traffic. I, I don't know citations. how that could possibly be. That 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 astonishes me. That that has <laughs> gone down when we have more and more blatant. Uh, Disregard, again, disregard for laws. Wow, okay. Well, just one thing yes, to remember, please. and Armin could probably please. tell the exact dollar amounts, but when, if somebody gets like a $400 speeding ticket, we only get a portion of that. Right, So right. somehow there's, it <clears throat> seems like over the, over the years, there's more and more that gets peeled off for court admin costs and, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, yeah, it doesn't mean that number of tickets there's, there's not really a correlation in terms of, of uh, courts are taking more from <coughs> yeah, Our portion, if I can add to that, is about 20% uh, of the citations that are issued. And we're actually in the, in the works with the courts to see if we could get a detailed report from them and to identify what their costs are and see if they've added something um, along the way and that we were not aware of. So uh, we're, we're actually looking into that right now. Okay, so the thing I want to understand is that this does not mean that the number of tickets that have been given is down. That has gone down also. When you look at the, the, the police report where it's uh, issued, I believe, it on a monthly basis, the, the, traffic, the traffic violations, um, uh, the citation has decreased actually. Yeah. I, I, I need that. Is there a reason? There, and there might be a reason for that. And, and, you know, it's funny because we talked about this a couple of days ago when we were reviewing the actual slides for today. And, and my question was why the decrease? And, you know, they're working with um, the administration office of the courts to find out why we're getting a lesser amount from them. And the, the citation piece for us has to do with education um, that, that we are, it's, it's a multifaceted approach as it relates to safety in our community. And so I'm sure the chief can, can answer yes, this way chief. better yeah, than where I. He is where here. is he? Oh, he's sitting here. Yeah, yeah I was here. looking I, for I him. Was he's hiding call in the back. There you go. <laughs> you were hiding. He was hiding. He was, hiding. He was better. <laughs> 
Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. So are uh, tickets council. really, the number of tickets are really going down? I'm, I'm actually looking at the uh, citation data for the calendar year that just closed. Uh, and actually the number of citations for that calendar year, and I know they work on a fiscal year, are actually up 16%. So we're, we're addressing it through, uh, through a, couple of, uh, a, a couple of things. One is obviously officers each have discretion on how they handle any given individual situation. Um, I can tell you on numerous conversations with those officers, there is um, frustration uh, from their perspective with the court system. Uh, because they do issue the citations, they go to court, and depending on the merits of each individual case, cases is, can be dismissed, fines can be reduced. Uh, it seems um, that when that happens, somehow we're the ones who we suspect get shorted on that because what starts is the base fines for the citations that we have are actually relatively small, but by the time you add the various penalty assessments that the courts have, it very easily racks up to, uh, to $700. And then finally, uh, one of the things that's starting to help us uh, bring this along is we're shifting over to electronic cit uh, citation writers. So in my day, you had to do it by pencil. And if you have handwriting like I do, the courts have a hard time reading it and it comes back for correction. So now our motor officers are all using electronic citations that allow it to print out, allows you to scan the driver's license, put all the data in, and looking this next year, we'll be looking at expanding that, which will make it easier and faster for the, the, the officers to issue citations on traffic stops. I was, I was just figuring they would have riots in the street if they thought that our we weren't giving citations for all of the yeah. No, I can, I can, I can tell you that, uh, yeah. in Don't fact, I was having a conversation <laughs> with a friend of mine this weekend, and one of his sons got a citation, and I looked at <laughs> where it was and what it was for. It was like, well, it's in an area where we get a lot of citizen complaints, and it's for one of those violations for which we get complaints. So we use a combination of our grant funds and our regular, our regular officers to go out and work particular areas. Yeah, because I, like I like to tell everybody you're doing, like, the best you can, which I know you are. We have Council to reconcile between the fiscal year and the calendar year in terms of what finance has and what police has uh, for the numbers um, in terms of our uh, KPIs. We just need to reconcile that and make sure we're doing <laughs> it in the same it, time it, frame. It ships it out, and I am looking right. at the calendar year, yeah. so. so thanks, Mayor. So, um, I, you know, I had a very strange conversation last week where a resident was incensed that we don't, we're not stringent enough. He said our police department used to be much more harsh, and he misses that, and he believes that. <laughs> yes, and, and this was a relatively young person. He said, you know, we. That's that's the irony of this, right? Yes. When you're when you're harsh, people misinterpret that. Some people see some kind of. Um, discriminatory intent in some of it, but then when you stop being harsh, they realize what they missed and what the impact is. So the question was, and I guess you're telling us that's not the case, we're still giving out a lot of citations, but there seems to be a sentiment out there that at least when it comes to traffic or when it comes to just people hanging out and not doing the proper things where they shouldn't be doing it, uh, like we're not on top of it, we're not harsh, we don't come down as hard as we used to. As I said, we've, is, we've, are we short we've, on staff? What's, is, is that, is there are times that we have officers that are out injured. We have times that we have officers that are assigned to uh, specialized areas, like we spend a fair amount of time around the schools. So obviously there's a, a, a cost benefit to everything uh, that we do. But we have, uh, with both our traffic uh, unit, the traffic bureau itself, and with our patrol officers placed a renewed emphasis, emphasis on traffic enforcement, um, and it's, I guess it is kind of ironic that someone would say that we're too harsh because most of the time, uh, or we're not harsh enough because most of the time the complaints come back the exact opposite way that why are you giving me a ticket? Uh, you know, whether it's as simple as why are you giving me a ticket for not having license plates on my car or why are you giving me a ticket for the tinted windows or why are you giving me a ticket for the modified exhaust systems, all of which are routine complaints that we have from the neighbors, all of which we've asked our officers to, uh, to uh, increase their level of enforcement and lower their level of tolerance for in addition to the normal stuff that we do for, for speed and stop signs. I think one, one other thing that we have to bear in mind is, you know, I was talking to some people as well, they were asking the same thing, how come we don't issue more citations? But uh, my understanding was on Glen Oaks Boulevard, there were like 900 tickets issued uh, at one point, and still you couldn't slow them down. But the other issue that we have is uh, because of Prop 47 and AB 109, 
the type of calls that we get and our, our resources are good or will go to is different than just uh, traffic citation and they are most of our police officers are responding to more serious crimes than just issuing a ticket to, for, for speeding or tinted windows or not having a license plate so our resources are the same but our issues have, have grown and that's what we are we are responding to mostly that's that's my understanding of it I mean, officers have a, a busy day. Traffic is but one of the things, obviously, that they have to do, responding to calls for service. And as I said, we've, we've all stood here before to discuss the complications of the combination of AB 109, Prop 47, Prop 57, and some of the challenges that that creates for us and where we need to put our resources to try to maintain a, a safe community. But as I said, that's, that doesn't mean we don't have a commitment to traffic safety. Um, you know, hopefully whoever you're having the conversation with, that will that will shift. As I said, usually the phone calls that come to my office are the other ones where someone's complaining that they've actually gotten a citation for something. I want to ask the guy to call you. <laughs> Please, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. It, it would be nice to hear one where it's like, hey, you guys aren't being tough enough, uh, as opposed <laughs> to the ones that I normally get where we're being where we're being too tough. And why did your why didn't your officer give me a break? Or you know, why did they get the citation? That's one of the Chief, I think just writing citation is is not the right thing, in my opinion. It should be along with education. You just can't just write tickets and say, okay, I solved this problem. I think it should be combined with the education of the offenders. Well, said so most people, you know, if they, want, if they get the citation and they want to uh, avoid having the insurance rates go up, often go to traffic school, so there does become an education component to it. As I said, we have not taken away the discretion of officers to, to issue warnings, and, and they do. On the, other hands, where we, on the other hand, where we do get the complaints in neighborhoods uh, or where we have issues, we do ask officers to go in and write citations. Uh, the issuance of a citation, uh, I think the only study I could ever find is issuance of citations actually do impact driving behavior. Uh, it came out of Canada a number of, a number of years ago. It's the only one I could actually, actually find, whereas warnings may not. Though, um, more recently, there are some experiments going off up north in San Jose about written warnings and uh, whether or not they're effective. So, you know, we're, we're amenable to try a few different things to see what, to see what works, how it works with the community, and ultimately how we can change the, dri the driving behavior of some of our community and improve traffic safety. Thank you. Councilman uh, Majorian. Hi, Chief. So let's, um, I'm not, I've heard it from both sides as well, but let's be clear. Do Glendale traffic enforcement officers have a ticket quota that they must meet? <laughs> they do not. <laughs> okay, Legally, can I give them one of those? They don't. For, for those who get the tickets, say, oh, he's just trying to fill his quota. No, there is no, there is, there is no quota. And our officers have the discretion to stop, warn, ticket, uh, and anything else that may develop. Right. That they, they, have, they have that discretion. And that comes in their training that we That's correct. offer them uh, extensively. Okay. That's correct. I think we're doing a good job, but... Thank you, Chief. Any more questions, comments okay, on this item? Have, I do. I have one more, and that's on a um, the item from uh, Mr. Galanian uh, <coughs> requesting twenty-four thousand for the uh, related to the railroad crossing quiet zone. Is that unexpected, yes. or is that ongoing, or how did that come about? I thought that was all taken care of. Mr. Mayor, Member City Council, Council Member Devine, uh, as you know, back in two thousand sixteen, we were successful in establishing. <laughs> quiet zones at uh, three of our at-grade crossings at uh, Grandview, Sonora, and Flower. And as part of the process, uh, CPUC, California Public Utilities Commission, had made some additional requirements such as additional safety lighting, signage, and striping that we implemented as part of the, our application. This $24,000 is the cost of the annual maintenance that will be performed by Metrolink to maintain all these additional signage and striping and lighting and uh, through a reimbursement agreement that will come in front of you in the next few weeks. So it's an ongoing annual cost of maintenance. This wasn't in our budget. This was not budgeted previously because we didn't have an invoice. They have, to this date, they haven't invoiced us. So we're just waiting for that and we're just preparing in advance. Any more questions? Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Council Member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sananian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes. Next item, please. 8B is Director of Human Resources regarding establishment of classification 
Titles and Compensation for Employees of the City of Glendale Compensation Alignment. B1 is the resolution of the Glendale City Employees Association, GCA, and GCA confidential classifications. Two is the resolution of the Glendale Management Association, GMA, and GMA exempt confidential classifications. Okay, Ms. Beers. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, over the last three years we've been before you during the mid-year budget process uh, to talk with you uh, regarding the compensation alignment process that we have here in Glendale. This process has been outside of the uh, MOU uh, with GCA and the GMA, and it's um, a process for us to really remain competitive in the market as it relates to our employees and our ability to be able to re retain our employees and not be a training ground for our employees to uh, unfortunately leave to other municipalities. Um, Mr. Doyle will go into some details regarding uh, the classifications that were studied um, and uh, the, the percentages that are out from average, and I, and I want to emphasize average because oftentimes people uh, mistake uh, some of the adjustments that are being made and think that uh, it's something above average, um, and by way of our compensation alignment and compensation strategies that we've had in place, we strive to be uh, with, within the average and, and not above that, but not whole, wholly beneath that as well. And so with that, Mr. Doyle, um, if you can uh, cover the projects with us. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, the item before you are resolutions addressing classification and compensation adjustments for various <coughs> categories of employees represented by both the GCEA and GMA bargaining groups. This process has come to be known as compensation alignment, where we target specific job categories in areas where we've fallen behind in our competitive compensation structure. These are job classifications where we've experienced difficulty in both the recruitment and retention of our most talented and skilled employees. This process involved a compensation survey of over 40 classifications within the GCEA and GMA bargaining units, utilizing our traditional 10 city labor market uh, comparisons. As anticipated, uh, the vast majority of the job classifications studied were significantly below their labor market comparisons, uh, some by up to 10, 20, and even 30 percent. Our objective here was to try and target those jobs that are lagging behind the most in the labor market. You'll see that many of the classifications uh, selected here are highly skilled or professional level positions cutting across various professions. You see many in the engineering, the IT, a telecommunications area, accounting, finance, uh, some of the utility uh, management level positions, uh, fire dispatchers, police, uh, uh, fire uh, inspectors. Uh, in addition, our uh, automotive mechanics, uh, which we have many of, which uh, uh, we do have difficulty, uh, again, recruiting and retaining these positions. Recommendations here are to adjust these salary ranges, obviously depending upon how far below in our labor market uh, average they're off. Um, essentially, we're adding steps to those classifications that were the furthest below uh, within the salary structure uh, system, and uh, gradually over the course of two to three years, hoping to see all of these uh, classifications brought up to at or near the average. So with that, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Questions? Any questions? Yes. Uh, yes. I just oh, raised sorry. the question, but since I raised it with you and me and uh, Council Member Nigerian were present, so I want to make sure that people they may look at this chart. If you can show page two, can you show on TV? Page two. Can you show? You can. Anyway. Uh, this this is long chart and at left side it says job class and on right of it it says salary class and in the middle is classification title and this goes pages and pages and I was looking before and just yesterday both numbers are same I thought most of the numbers are same some of them will change but they stayed the same numbers. So what's the reason we don't, don't say job class, salary class, and then we have one number and then the classification? Exactly. What should be the purpose of further down? You have to go further down. Whoever is doing this, Page go further two. down. 
Mr. Mayor, Councilman yeah, Agajani, exactly. and, uh, what those represent uh, for each of these uh, these resolutions are the job titles, and yes, we've duplicated the uh, the uh, what you would call the salary ranges. They're all the same, the one on the right and the one on the left, for each of the job classifications, and that's just a function of of the new. Uh, uh, computer system that we have that we transitioned to in the past year and future resolutions. We'll just have one column probably on the right indicating the salary range. And those salary ranges uh, uh, are uh, uh, reflect the, uh, the exhibit A, which is further on in this, uh, in this report. Uh, if you can look up those job titles and match it with the salary that are, that are reflected in the, in, in the salary ranges. So sorry if that's confusing, but uh, um, We'll work on, on improving this and making it maybe a little simpler in the future. Thank you. Questions? Councilmember Najarian. <clears throat> so, Mr. Doyle, we have um, five uh, bargaining units in the city uh, police, fire, GMA, GCEA, IBEW. Correct. And every two or three years, we have a master labor agreement with each one of them. Uh, and in that labor agreement, we discuss uh, cost of living increases, raises, as, and other items as well relating to their employment. We also have a, a step and column chart, is that what you call it, or a protocol where people within those certain classifications, based on experience, training, years on the job, can reach a higher level of income. That's correct. correct. So what we're doing today is we have identified uh, about 80, 80 different job classifications or about 80. Uh, it's closer to about 40 between 40. the two bargaining units. About 40 uh, job classifications that are being paid below the surveyed average as we determined. This adjustment is giving those classifications a increase in pay to meet the average. That's correct. This is not done, this is not a requirement by the labor agreements that we've entered into, but it's a good faith, um, a good faith effort by staff management as well as the leaders of the bargaining groups, in this case GCEA and GMA, to seek some equity for a certain number of employers, employees. We don't want to lose them in other cities. We don't want them to lose their morale if they stay with us, but it's an attempt to bring some fairness to the, to the system. That's correct. So I very much applaud these efforts, uh, not just yours. Um, city, from the city manager on down, of course, council, like I said, it is behind every good decision that the city makes, uh, as well as uh, I, know, I see Gail Stockton and uh, I'm not sure who, who's the GMA? Craig, Craig, Craig Casey. Uh, is here. So thank you for working together, for trying to keep our employees at a very high functioning uh, level. We're still down in terms of total number of employees. We're still asking a lot from everyone, but I'm very happy that we're able to do this. And this is something that we will continue to do going forward as we work through the as I guess as salaries change throughout the region and as, as our duties and our uh, number of employees flux in and out. That's correct. It would be okay. our intent to continue this process. I'm very happy process. with that, so thank you. And uh, just, just for the public's information, I think we are down about five to 700 employees compared to what we had in eight years ago. Up to from 1,800 to, to 1,300 now? Uh, budgeted positions, it went from the high 1,900s to the high 1,500s, but if you include vacancies, you're exactly correct. Uh, we're probably in the high 1,300s right, right now, or the mid-1,300s mid as far 1300. as actual staff. <laughs> Versus a few years ago that we were at mid-1,800s. Correct. Correct. All right. Thank you. I agree with my colleague. I think uh, it is important for us to keep the employees that they're skilled and it's very difficult to find. I mean, finding a good help is something else, keeping it is another issue. So it's very difficult to keep good employees if they're not really satisfied with the salaries they make and they're, they're 
10, 15, 20% below average. Average, not the top. So that's what we're get, trying to get them into, to average them out with the, the comparable cities. That is, that is correct. All right, any, any more questions for Mr. Doyle? I would just like to say that I'm in agreement. I think it's a, a good thing to do for our employees. Uh, they're giving us extra <coughs> time uh, for, you know, the same salary that they've been receiving for a long time. And this adjustment is uh, is fair, equitable, and uh, I'm all in favor of it. Okay. Well, I'll move 8B1 and 2, Mr. Mayor. second. Roll call, please. Council members Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sananian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian. Yes. Next item, please. Next item on the agenda is City Clerk regarding appointing drafters of arguments for and for and against measure relating um, to amending City Charter relating to the date of the general municipal election. C1 is a motion appointing drafters. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, this is uh, part of a package of reports that come back to you as part of um, the decision that was made by this Council to move ahead with um, actions to have our elections in the city of Glendale coincide with a general uh, state election date, uh, primary date. So since the council has uh, called for a special election to occur um, during this June, uh, we now are asking you to appoint uh, drafters for the arguments for, per our Glendale Municipal Code, there's an order in which they may be considered. Um, that is uh, first and foremost officers of the city elected by the people followed by appointive officers of the city, um, followed by bona fide associations of citizens, followed by individual voters. Uh, the task before you is a fairly simple and straightforward one since all of the council <coughs> members did uh, send to the city clerk's office requests to sign on to an argument for. There were no uh, correspondences for an argument against as a precaution. We also, uh, I myself as a city clerk, as elections official submitted a request to write the argument for since this is a ministerial adjustment to uh, correct the charter so it will be in sync with state law which we're now being required to follow along with your interim city manager Ms. Beers who also submitted a request to write an argument for. It is up to you to decide so, how you wish to proceed. Right. And, and so, just, just so it is limited to five persons that can sign so it can either be you know the five council members or it could be uh, three council members and Mr. Kasakian and and uh, Ms. Beers, and I think uh, Mr. Kazaki expressed that uh, it, there was some benefit from having the elections official and the chief administrative officer sign that along with council members. That's one viewpoint. The other viewpoint is just to have council members, so. Council Member Aljanian. I just want to say uh, that we had the choice to move it to November. Of course, it would be a harder process, but however, these council members will stay longer. So. I think this is a good compromise that we do the election in March and we stay a shorter period rather than stay until November. That's okay. what I want to say. Thank you, Councilor. Mr. Mayor, I, I understand the importance of the electoral official to sign on to this and be a proponent of it because this deals fundamentally with what it is that he does. So I will withdraw my. Um, Request to be a signatory in favor of uh, the city clerk. So, thank you, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Sinanian. So, we need one more, more uh, council member to withdraw her or his request in favor of uh, council. Are we happy, uh, to, are we happy to withdraw? I would be happy to do withdraw too. I mean, so it's a matter. Okay. I don't know why council so members are part of it. Somebody could just make a motion with. Okay, so Mr. is there a motion to the elected officials? Well, um, I also will defer to our uh, city clerk acting as the elections official. Uh, I think his name adds much more credibility to this type of action than having five councilmen who will <laughs> assuredly be <laughs> be pointed out are acting in their own self-interest to extend their terms on council. Therefore, let's let Artie do it. Because <laughs> <laughs> we need, we need, we need uh, our Artie and our city clerk, our interim city manager, and three council one. members. I don't know. So it can be just like one. It's no more than five, but it could be, it could be less. So it could be. be so the mayor four council members. And and so all four, four of you are withdrawn. I, I, I would. I, I, I would withdraw already. So I open the spot for Mr. Mayor, I would, I would suggest or recommend, um, and certainly up to you to decide to have along with the elections official. 
um, the interim, um, our acting CEO of the city, the chief executive officer, to also sign uh, her name alongside it. So, uh, so the voters. So we leave it up to you guys this time. But well, we, you, need, uh, no, we, we need a motion. You have to give the motion. And also, okay. if you wanted the mayor, if you want to sign on. I will sign on that. I don't have a problem with that. So I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that the city clerk, the acting uh, interim city manager, the mayor, council member Devine and council member Najarian be the signatories. Oh, I thought I took my name off, but that's well, okay. Everyone that's took their fine. names off, but now I, I put you back second? on. What did you do? You put me back on? Yeah. I appreciate the oh. faith that you're placing in me, but I would rather not defer. Yeah, I would rather. Okay. Okay. Is there a Is, subsequent, okay, the motion? The subsequent motion? Subsequent motion. I withdraw my motion. I'll move that the city clerk and don't anyone say no. The city manager <laughs> and the, the mayor be the signatories to this. Is there a second? Second. second. Roll call, please. Council members Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sinanian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes, next item, please. Item D is fire chief regarding uh, authorize the purchase of uh, Holmatro rescue equipment from fire service specification and supply and a request to dispense with competitive bidding. D1 is resolution to dispense with competitive bidding and authorize the purchase. If fish. Mr. Mayor, members of the city council, we are uh, in the midst of a purchase of a brand new ladder truck. If you uh, remember from my presentation uh, earlier, or later last year, we uh, the ladder truck is the big one. That's the, where the person drives the back. The tiller person drives the uh, back of the truck. And uh, that is uh, outfitted with a lot of rescue equipment, to which one uh, of the complements of extrication equipment, which I can show you if uh, Mr. Kasakian would show you the picture in our PowerPoint that I have. Call it what it is, Chief. That's what we all know it is. <laughs> we all know it is the jaws of life, sir. So uh, that's uh, the jaws of life are actually the ones on the left. The cutters are the ones on the right. Um, these are uh, s very highly tuned, uh, expensive, but well worth it uh, extrication equipment. We use these during uh, traffic collisions when people are trapped, uh, when we got to get through uh, pieces of metal, lift heavy items. Uh, that's what we use these pieces of equipment for. Uh, these pieces of equipment can basically cut through anything, any piece of metal that there is. Uh, as you well know, uh, the, uh, the titanium and the uh, high, high strength steels that are in modern luxury vehicles especially uh, are very difficult to cut with uh, regular um, extrication equipment. This, this equipment right here will cut through and we can uh, basically get bodies out of anybody out of a vehicle that's uh, entangled through a traffic collision or other means. So it is uh, my request that uh, you fund uh, $57,730 for this rescue equipment so that we can outfit our new ladder truck with this equipment. And I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Questions? I'll and move the item. And these are on display uh, every year on fire service day. Yes. At 21, you do your whole. Yes, sir. <coughs> every so every uh, second Saturday of May, uh, fire service day, we do a, a demonstration with this equipment where we tear uh, vehicles apart and we uh, basically make perfectly good cars into convertibles. So, <laughs> hey, what whoa, 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 whoa. is that casting aspersions on convertibles? No, we love convertibles, that's why we make them. Yeah, that's what I was saying. If there is a minor accident on my car, I want them to make it convertible for me. <laughs> we can do that, sir. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, before we all go to, into car conversion business, uh, is there a motion? I moved. So Second. Moved. Thank you. Roll call, please. Council members Agajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sunanian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes. Next item, please. He is Director of Public Works. Uh, I believe, was there, you know, we did have one card, I believe. Oh, yes, yes. Raphael I'm sorry. Did. I'm so sorry. I have one card. Uh, Rafael Mo. I'm sorry before. It's fine, but uh, I was just here to voice my opposition for this resolution to dispense with competitive bidding, but I guess the motion passed anyway. But my reasoning was the company Whole Matro is based in the Netherlands, and if you were to dispense with competitive bidding, you're essentially creating a monopoly on 
the Homatro company. And from the report I read, the Glendale Fire has been using Homatro equipment for nearly 12 years. Uh, so really, Homatro already kind of has a monopoly on the Glendale Fire Department. And what this would set, uh, it would send a message to this company that they can uh, essentially start raising their prices every year because they know the Glendale City Council and the fire department would be purchasing only from them and rejecting all other bids. So I was here to request uh, the uh, opening up the competitive bidding to 100% American companies to submit their bids. And even though in the report it was said that Holmatro, which is based in the Netherlands, does have manufacturing plants in the US, um, uh, manufactured in Maryland, the jaws of life, uh, a certain percentage of the profits are still going to go back to the Netherlands. And these are our American dollars, city council, taxpayer money. Why should it be exclusively going to the Netherlands um, in foreign countries? We should at least be asking uh, American companies, 100% American companies, to submit their bids. And this would have resulted in, a, I guess, much cheaper um, options and bids, which could have saved the city of Glendale a lot of money. And, uh, you know, one of the things mentioned in the report uh, was uh, the reasons for dispensing with competitive bidding was having numerous brands would uh, be uh, costly to the training of the firefighters. And, uh, you know, firefighters are great people, I have a lot of uh, respect for them, but, uh, you know, a lot of them are being paid astronomical salaries, you know, $150,000 a year, up to 250000 and it's reasonable to expect that they will be able to reasonably adapt to numerous other brands and companies. And the jaws of life, it's, there's a lot of other great American companies who make similar products, and it shouldn't be too much hassle in figuring out how to use them. So that was uh, my intent in coming here, but I guess it was already passed. Well, but, um, well I apologize for, for not. Uh, I yeah. really apologize for not. Uh, it's fine, you know, but uh, for but further... Um, Chief is here. I'm going to ask for, uh, Chief Fish to, to come back up yeah. and, and Just for further uh, motions and stuff, if you uh, are going to dispense with competitive bidding, please note uh, it's basically you're uh, you assuring a monopoly on these companies. And, you know, Holmatro is based in the Netherlands, <laughs> and our monies are going to uh, foreign countries. We want to stay America, American-built, American companies only. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Um, just so we're having a discussion about the itinerary pass, it would probably be appropriate for there to be a motion for reconsideration. Move to, just uh, to put on the floor so that... Move uh, to reconsider. Okay. Second. If it's, you heard the concerns of the gentleman. Oh, vote would you, yeah, there, there, oh we yeah, need to have a vote on. There needs to be a vote on. Council members Agajanian? This is just to have... Just, yeah, to, just, to just so we have the discussion. Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sananian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes. Mr. Mayor, yeah. members of City Council, uh, I, I did hear the concerns about uh, having American-made equipment. Um, and to be perfectly honest with you, when your life is in danger, when your body is entrapped inside of a vehicle with extremely high uh, tension steel uh, that is evolving every day, every single day, when a BMW is put out uh, for market, these high tension steels get stronger and stronger and stronger. That's why the fatalities that we see across the, the uh, nation are fewer and fewer on a regular basis because the, the vehicles get stronger and stronger. And we if all know the connection between Glendale and BMWs. Well, <laughs> yes, BMWs and other luxury vehicles. I use BMW because BMW truly is at the forefront of, of having these high tension steels within their vehicles. They have roll bars, roll cages that you wouldn't even see, uh, but you can actually, uh, Homatro knows all about this kind of stuff. So whether it's manufactured in the Netherlands, whether it's manufactured in Mexico or the United States, I'm looking for the best opportunity to save your life. This equipment is the most effective and most efficient at getting you out of a wrecked vehicle into that surgeon's table within the golden hour. We call it the golden hour because it has the highest propensity for survival should you be in an accident. I'm not looking to have, I'm not looking to, to uh, save money. I'm not looking for uh, saving American jobs, I'm looking to save lives. And that's the bottom line when it comes to why we buy Homatro tools. Homatro has uh, a corner on the market when it comes to research. They come out and train our, uh, our people for free whenever there's new technology. And uh, th that is not something that you get from Hearst or Amcus or any of the other American brands. 
So uh, therefore, I, it is my recommendation that we stay with Helmatro. And uh, again, it, it's, it's based on a lot of research. We've tested the other companies against Helmatro, and Helmatro always comes out on top of the, uh, the performance measures. Council so, uh, Chief, thank you. I, I, I usually am the one who brings up the issue of competitive bidding, but here's a situation where the, the argument that you make is so compelling. We're talking about human lives, we're talking about minutes saving a life. Um, so therefore, I, I think it's completely justified. And uh, the extra expense that's associated with it is also justified. Um, and even the fact that part of this equipment or, or there's a manufacturing facility in Maryland that yes. obviates the need for this discussion. So I'll move the item. I think there's a comment. Yeah. Oh. Is there a comment? I just, yes, I just wonder, Chief, do you have any study that you compare this equipment with other similar equipments in your position in your office? I do not have it in my office, but we, we, I can produce that information for you if you would like. Uh, again, when you look at the, the industry standard across the, the nation, FEMA, uh, Los Angeles City Fire Department, Los Angeles uh, County Fire Department, Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena, we use, this, we use these tools because you can have interoperability. If we get on a major uh, incident, say at the 5 and the 134 freeway, we know that if we have Homatro tools, we all know how to use them, we can, we can use the tools effectively to rescue those people. And again, I have personally, in 2005, when we first started the process of reevaluating this equipment, we moved away from Hearst based on the performance, based on the fact that they're lighter, they're safer, and more effective. Uh, so based on what you're saying, neighboring cities, yes. they are not using American models. They're or? using Homatro. All of them? Yes. Around us. All of them around us are using Homatro. All right, thank you. Okay. All right, thank you, Chief. Is there I'll a motion? Second the motion? There is a motion. Motion. I'll second. There's a motion and a second. Lo roll call, please. Councilmember Agajanian. On the same motion that we yes. passed, now yes. are we doing yes. it yes. again? Yes. 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 Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sunanian? Yes. Mayor Garpedian? Yes. I sign them, please. AD is Director of Public Works regarding Dorn Street and Adjacent Streets Improvements Project. E1 is a motion awarding con a construction contract to Palping DBA Excel Paving Company in the amount of $2,788,892.30, approving a 10% reserve for contingency in the amount of $278,889.23, rejecting all other bids and authorizing to execute the contract. Two is a motion authorizing an increase to West Coast Arborist contract in amount of $28,200 and authorizing to execute necessary contracts change order. And three is a resolution appropriating $247,161.96. Jelanian? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of City Council. I'm going to have Sarkis Aglanesian, our senior civil engineer, to make a short presentation on this uh, routine, rather routine, but significant project uh, upcoming for award. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Mr. Mayor and members of uh, City Council, um, on behalf of the Director of Public Works, I'm here to present to you guys um, Duran Street and Adjacent Streets Improvements Project, which is in front of you. Um, the scope of work for this subject project mainly involves street resurfacing, um, Cape Seal, Slurry <coughs> Seal, as well as, oh, sorry about that, you guys. So the scope of work involves um, street resurfacing, um, Cape Seal, Slurry Seal, uh, these are all pavement treatments, uh, pavement rehabilitation measures. Um, it also involves removal and repair of damaged sidewalks, um, curbs, driveway approaches, construction of new curb ramps to meet ADA guidelines, installation of new striping, signing and pavement markings, um, new signal installation at Balboa and Geneva, right across R.D. White Elementary School, as well as signal upgrades throughout Doran. Um, and there's a portion of sewer lining um, as part of this project. The project location map is shown here. As you guys can see, um, the project is gonna take place on Doran Street between Grand Boulevard and Adams, um, as well as the adjacent streets highlighted in red. The red streets, uh, such as Maryland Avenue, Maryland Place, Kenwood Place, Jackson, Howard, Morita, are gonna undergo slurry seal treatment. Um, Doran is gonna undergo a street resurfacing treatment 
and a portion of Jackson is going to undergo uh, Cape Seal as well as a street resurfacing treatment. The engineer's estimate for this project um, was $2,673,000. The lowest bid received was from Excel Paving Company in the amount of $2,788,892.30. We also had a optional bid uh, to replace, to remove and replace um, trees throughout this project of which West Coast Arborist came in at the lowest bid. Uh, we're asking also for a reserve for contingencies in, in the amount of 10% uh, of the contract amount, as well as a 10% construction management allocation. Um, the number of bidders on the project, there were six bidders. Uh, the funding sources used that will be used for this project consist of um, Senate Bill 1, um, SB1 funds, Measure R funds, gas tax funds, and sewer funds. The community outreach that we did um, for this project involved uh, a community meeting that took place uh, with the residents here um, in uh, City Hall, um, as well as a meeting with Artie White staff um, for Artie White Elementary School. Uh, and top, on top of all that, actually, we, we also uh, mailed out 1,500 notifications to the affected community. The project schedule is slated for April of this year to begin construction and be completed, uh, barring any unforeseen circumstances, by August of 2018. Um, the work around Artie White Elementary School, as is normal practice uh, for us in Public Works, is to take place during the summer recess and in the event that the work is not completed during the summer recess, we'll be doing some work on weekends, um, as well as work after drop off and before school pickup hours. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you guys may have. Any questions? Council Member Sinai. Uh, your microphone. Lowest Mr. Council Member. The lowest bid came in $115,000 above the engineer's estimate. Is that within sort of the range that we expect bids to come in? Um, or was that, I'm saying, was it an unexpectedly high low bid? Um, no, it wasn't an unexpectedly high low bid. Um, it's actually within the range that the bids have been coming in at historically. And one of the reasons for this, um, Council Member Sinanian, is because the traffic signal portion of this came in, a, came in a little bit higher than our estimate, but the traffic signal portion is covered by Measure R funds, and one of the items of this uh, motion is to um, appropriate additional Measure R funds, which we are entitled to. If I can add to that, Council Member Sinanian, um, our engineers base their estimates on previous bids, and that continuously changes. So we have uh, really no way of gauging what the bids are going to come in. It's just an estimate based on previous and uh, bids, and they can go up or down uh, depending on the market, depending on uh, whether the contractors, the bidders, have jobs or they're desperate for jobs. So it's a little subjective. But it's only about 4% above the engineer's estimate, the lowest bid. No, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. I have a question. Council Member Alexander. Uh, when you say you are, your engineers, they do the estimate based on former estimates, previous estimates? Yes, uh, Council Member Agajanian. So the only basis for our engineers, because we don't construct um, elements of this construction work. So the only data we have is based on previous work by similar contractors on similar projects. However, we do escalate it for time. If it was two years ago, we do add the inflation to it. So um, per se, nobody looks at the equipment, the prices has been changed, went up or higher to have better feeling of what's going on in the market? That's the inflation adjustment we add to the previous bids, yes. Um, we, we use engineers' news record. They publish every month um, the uh, consumer price index on equipment, material, and labor. That's what we use. 
uh, but primarily is based on similar projects in the past. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? Is there a motion? Move the item. Second. Roll call, please. Thank Council. you. Council Member Zagajanian? Yes. Devine? Yes. Najarian? Yes. Sunanian? Yes. Mayor Garpetian? Yes. Next item, please. Next item on the agenda is oral communication. Discussion is a uh, limited item, is not part of this agenda. Each speaker will be allowed five minutes. Council may question or respond to the speaker, but there will be no debate or decision, and City Manager may refer the matter to the appropriate department for investigation and report. Thank you. First speaker <laughs> is uh, Chinook Ramirez, followed by Joseph Walpet followed by Glenn Webb. Thank you very much. Oh dear. Thank you. This is a second call to action to the Department of Justice, DMV, ATF, DEA, INS, and ICE to fervently investigate the following list of Latino et al. gangbangers and their criminal emprise, enterprises who are committing financial crimes, property crimes, and crimes to persons, primarily against legal law-abiding citizens and senior citizens. Let us stop these evil gangbangers from committing home invasion robberies, theft of, theft of property, wherever our home or castle is at. We should implement Sharia law and chop off their limbs and tongues for being lying thieves. Now that would end their criminal life and public safety would be restored. Now the license plate numbers are as follows. Seven, M as in Mary, V as in Victory, V as in Vortex, 887. Next, six, R as in Rat, F, M as in Mary, D as in David, 814. Next, eight, A as in Apple, D as in David, B as in Boy, 537. Next, five, Z as in Zebra, E as in Egg, J as in Japan, 305. Next, six, X as in Extra, L as in Love, D as in David, 728. Next, four, H as in Harry, T as in Tom, Z as in Zebra, 755. Next, seven, Z as in Zebra, R as in Rat, X as in Extra, 135. Next, five, W as in World, I as in India, T as in Tom, 330. Next, a as in apple, Z as in zebra, L as in love, zero, five, six. Next, seven, A as in apple, U as in umbrella, U as in under, seven, seven, six. Next, five, E as in egg, V as in victory, Z as in zebra, two, seven, six. Next, seven, U as in umbrella, L as in love, L as in Lucy, five, seven, three. Next, seven, Z as in zebra, W as in world, Sam, four, nine, nine. Next, five, H as in Harry, J as in Japan, Z as in Zebra, nine, three, two. Lastly, six, V as in David, N as in Nancy, K as in King, three, seven, six. The above mentioned license plate numbers are owned by vicious, wicked, and homicidal gangbangers, Latinos and non-Latinos. They run several black market criminal monopolies and illegal drugs, weapons, and contraband enterprises by using extortion and brute force. Their cocktail of criminal mayhem includes child human trafficking, pedophilia, poison, felony harassment and bank stalking, home invasion robberies, arson, burglaries in residential, commercial, and industrial areas, including storage units, grand theft, auto, uh, grand theft auto, homicide, criminal breaking to your motels and hotels, where they can hack into your hotel room without a car key. This includes major high-end hotels like Mr. C's, Beverly Hill Hotel, Beverly Hills Plaza, Century City Hotel, Holiday Inn, All Marriott Hotel, Sheraton Hotel, the Crown Plaza Hotel, the Ritz Carlton Hotel, and I've stayed in all of them. Just look on YouTube and the, the buffoons at the front desk tell you no one can get into your room, don't believe them. If it's not the Latino maids and servicemen illegally getting into your room, it's the gangbangers. That's why there's a rampant ID and mail theft, not to mention their expensive belongings. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, I carry my shopping cart, which is back there. I carry most of my important things because of years of theft and a string of robberies from each hotel and motel. That's where I've been living. You can only imagine how much money I've spent. Yes, all hotels lie. You can hack open into any hotel and motel door without a car key. 
suddenly I come to find out that many hotels and motels contract out or are used in outside vendors to handle their security. They handle their car key hotel security for the doors, which have failed miserably. Do we as innocent victims have legal standing and triable issues to sue our hotels and motels and their car key vendors um, for fraud and false pretenses and breach of good faith and fair dealings? Um, absolutely. We have invasion of privacy, illegal placing of audio and video fiber in hotel rooms, which is now becoming an epidemic, deprived of our quiet people enjoyment and theft of personal information and personal property, not to mention negligent infliction of emotional distress. And uh, you're being forced to carry all your belongings around like I do. So again, this is a revolving door criminal racket by the criminal underworld gangs and the big enchilada cabal and their secret alliance. God bless America, and God bless Donald Trump. We gotta stop this. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Joseph, followed by Glenn Webb, <coughs> followed by Roberta Medford. Mr. Mayor and uh, members of the City Council, my name is Joe Volpe. I've been a resident of Glendale for 42 years. The other night at a neighborhood dinner with friends, I was discussing the Grayson repowering project with Glenn Webb and listening to his vision and plan for a zero carbon Glendale. Glenn made the scalp potatoes, by the way. <laughs> he mentioned that he would be at the city council meeting tonight to continue the effort to get the city council to pause the GWP project to replace the Grayson generators with new gas turbines and study clean energy alternatives. That looked to me like a reasonable thing to do. And so I offered to come and introduce Glenn and his credentials so he would have a bit more of his five minutes to talk about his vision and plan. So here I am to do just that. Glenn Webb received his undergraduate degree from Purdue University in aeronautical and astronautical engineering. <clears throat> he is a rocket scientist. He then received his master's degree in electrical engineering <clears throat> and computer science from UCLA and then studied business and finance at the USC Graduate School of Business. He's an underachiever. He had a 26-year career at Lockheed designing electronic systems for military aircraft. He had a second 26-year career consulting in the fields of pollution, control, clean air, and finance. Over that period, he had over 175 client companies, including some you may have heard of, like General Electric, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories, Toyota Motors, and the U.S. State Department. For each and every one of these companies, he studied their pollution control and clean air problem proposed the solution and manufactured the equipment for the solution in his factory in Riverside. <coughs> for over 20 years, he was licensed real estate broker in both California and North Carolina and purchased and managed residential and commercial income <coughs> properties for his clients. Over the past 50 years, he has proved, provided financial planning advice to his clients and has prepared over 300 personal corporate and partnership tax results for himself and clients. He is a creative, guy, both in the kitchen and, lab and laboratory. I think you should listen as he tells you about his plan for a reliable zero carbon electric energy system for Glendale and how we can get there in five years at a cost of less than the proposed GWP's $500 million. Thank you for your time. I think I heard new thinking from the council members earlier this evening this leads to a future that we're all going towards, which is to use re re renewable energy that does not eat up our planet. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn Webb, followed by uh, Roberta Medford. I don't know if she's here or not. Followed by Rafael M. Mo. Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, my name is Glenn Webb. I'm a 25-year resident of Glendale. I listened to the status update presented by GWP and their consultants last week. I was disappointed at the conclusions reached after four or five years of study and an expenditure of some $8 million. I think we can do better. 
In particular, three assertions made during that nearly one hour presentation made me want to jump up and, jump up and say, what? First, I heard someone say that we could float a $500 million bond, pay back the bond plus interest, and it wouldn't affect our electric rates. I kept thinking, where is that alternative universe where there is such a thing as a free lunch? Second, GWP and the consultants said several times that they have looked at clean energy solutions like solar and that they are not practical or are too expensive. To that I say, seriously? Let me explain. Ten years ago, I purchased and installed on my home a system with 69 solar panels. I paid $5.50 a watt for those panels, 15 times what they cost today, 35 cents a watt. Those panels have an efficiency of 13%. Panels today are 50% higher, 22%. Three years later, I installed a second system with 32 panels, and I paid $3.50 a watt for those, only 10 times today's costs. Those panels I mounted on trackers, which follow the sun, produce 40% more electricity than fixed panels. I also installed a complete battery backup system with electronics and automatic switching. This system uses 100-year-old lead-acid technology, like the battery in your car, and costs $600 per kilowatt hour of storage. Today's technology is made in California, lithium-ion technology and including electronics ready to plug in costs $300 per kilowatt hour. Several years ago, we had an outage in our neighborhood. My wife and I were watching television, and we got a call from our next door neighbor. She said all the power was out and asked why our house was the only one on the block with lights on. We were not aware of the outage. We had not been affected at all. Third, I heard a statement regarding battery storage. They said that too, impractical and too expensive. To that I say, seriously? I did it seven years ago with 100-year-old technology. Today it's half the cost of only seven years ago and falling. As for cost and investment, the systems I installed in my home cost much more than they would today. I put them in anyway. And today, I'm less than one year away from having recouped 100% of my invest investment through a reduction in my GWP bill less than 11 years for old technology and expensive technology. I have a vision of what we can achieve in Glendale without any new gas turbines. GWP stated we already have 64% of our electric supply from zero carbon sources. I ask, why not 100%? They've been studying for four years and have concluded that the answer is four new gas turbines. I've been studying for a month and I conclude that we can get there with zero carbon in five years at a cost of less than 500 million. Did anyone ask GWP or their consultants to come up with a plan for a zero carbon Glendale in five years? Why have we not asked them to do so? This is what I will do for the council. I will return next week for my five minutes to discuss solar energy and to correct some grossly inaccurate and misleading information presented to you by GWP status report last week. I will give you up-to-date information on solar technology and how we might achieve a more effective implementation approach in Glendale. Then, in two weeks, I'll return and use my five minutes to do the same thing with battery storage technology and reliability. I'll discuss what our real power needs are in emergencies and natural disasters, as well as under normal operating conditions and how we can meet them. Then, at the request of at least three of the council people, I will return in three weeks and spend 15 minutes to give you a detail of my ideas and a plan for achieving zero carbon in Glendale in five years at a cost of less than $500 million. I will do this and not charge you $8 million for it. I would request that the council ask GWP and their consultants to do the same, to return in three weeks and present their plan in 15 minutes for a zero carbon Glendale in five years. They have a lot of talented scientists and engineers. Surely they can do better than one 70-year-old retired scientist. When you've heard my plan in three weeks and at least one other that I know is in process, I think you'll be in a better position to make a decision on whether to proceed with the GWP plan or pause and study a clean energy future for Glendale. Thank you for your time. I have copies of this presentation with, uh, with a, I'll leave them with the clerk along with my contact information. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Is Roberta here, Medford? No? Raphael? followed by Sam Brockman, followed by James 
St. Albans. Good evening. I've lived in La Crescenta for nearly 20 years, and I'm here to speak in opposition of the two Welcome to Glendale concrete signs installed in the middle of Foothill Boulevard on Pennsylvania and Lowell Avenues. Besides the design of those signs being quite ugly, I mean, they look like tombstones in the middle of the road, the signs are a blatant traffic hazard, which have already caused two traffic collisions, placing, <coughs> placing the public at risk and wasting our taxpayer money. It will only be a matter of weeks before another car crashes into them, which makes these signs a liability issue for the city, a concern which has already been shared by many of my neighbors as well. But I'm afraid that there was an ulterior motive or hidden message in the placement of those two signs, which I believe was a way for Glendale to obnoxiously slap the residents of La Crescenta in their faces and a way for Glendale to assert its dominance over the annexed La Crescenta portion. The Crescenta Highlands section of Glendale has more in common with the unincorporated section of La Crescenta than with the rest of the city of Glendale. And this sign will probably decrease property values since the name Glendale carries with it the stigma of overdevelopment, mediocre schools, and horrible traffic. Those who are in support of these concrete signs point out the fact that there already exists blue sidewalk mounted signs welcoming citizens to the city of Glendale. And those in support claim that no controversy came from those blue signs which stated the same message. But immediately underneath those blue signs are signs that proclaim the area as being the Crescenta Highlands District of Glendale, a very important designation which the new concrete median signs do not have. We are simply asking for, the Glendale, for Glendale to acknowledge and incorporate, incorporate the La Crescenta name into these concrete signs, as currently the message can be misleading to passing motorists or tourists who traditionally associate Glendale with the downtown dis district, i.e. the Americana, Glendale Galleria, skyscrapers, et cetera, et cetera. I want to mention that the city of Glendale has two other signs placed in the median at Verdugo Road on the intersections of Broadview Drive and La Crescenta Avenue, which welcome the public to the Spar Heights District of Glendale. So if you have signs that say Spar Heights District, then why not erect a concrete sign in La Crescenta that would have said, welcome to the Crescenta Highlands District, or something else that would include the La Crescenta name in it. This got me wondering as to why the city does not have concrete welcome signs in far south Glendale. Hmm, is it because Glendale is ashamed of associating itself with the gang-ridden, dirty, dilapidated, illegal alien gangbanger areas of far south Glendale? Interesting. Mr. Mayor and City Council, tear down these signs. But on a more positive note, I would like to congratulate and thank the city for continuing its local ban on marijuana. And I hope the city will maintain this ban for eternity. Marijuana is a vile, despicable drug. It will kill you. But unfortunately, the state has made it easier for our kids to get by legalizing it. In fact, I constantly see middle school kids smoking marijuana outside the schools. But not to worry, because our wonderful President Donald Trump and Attorney General Jeff Sessions will be cracking down on rebellious rogue states like California, which have illegally legalized marijuana and have disobeyed federal law. I know the council will revisit this issue in the coming year, but I'd like to remind everyone that cannabis is still illegal in the eyes of the federal government. No questions about it. And finally, as an announcement to the public, if you would like to report suspected illegal aliens, please call the Homeland Security ICE hotline at 866-347-2423. Report and deport. Glendale police must work with ICE and Homeland Security to deport the criminal illegal aliens. Gangbangers, so-called dreamers, must go. No DACA, no amnesty. Put American dreamers first. America first. Okay. To conclude, I want to remind everyone to stay away from drugs, stay away from marijuana, read your Bibles, exercise your constitutional rights, report suspected illegal aliens to the ICE hotline, and vote Republican. Thank you, and God bless Donald Trump. Oh, and uh, can the city install more comfortable chairs for the audience? Because my rear end is hurting, and I know other city councils like Burbank, they have these uh, auditorium-style seatings with the armrests and the cushions, and they fold down. And I know Burbank has a nice mural in the back, so stop being so cheap, Glendale. You need to provide for the comfort of your <coughs> citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our gentle manner compensates for the... For the chair is not being very, very, very comfortable. Dan Brotman, followed by James St. Aubin. South Glendale is a lovely place. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council Members, and City Staff. Uh, that's kind of a hard one to follow. Um, 
Do your uh, best, Mr. Bradman. It's okay. I want to respond to some of what we heard at last week's council meeting, and I have at least three pages here and more at home, so obviously I won't finish it in my five minutes, but uh, like a good Charles Dickens novel, I'll I'm just keep partying. coming back and, and uh, giving you um, updates. Um, firstly, I heard some very good and insightful points from everyone on the dais last week and from staff and from the consultants, and I do mean everyone, even those of you who don't necessarily support what we're doing. Despite claims that we are ideologues, we're always listening, and we're always willing to respond to new information as it's presented. Uh, and let me say one thing that you haven't heard much from me. I do very much appreciate the success that Glendale Water and Power has had in increasing the renewable portfolio, and for all of you for supporting their efforts. I also appreciate some of the other things they've done. For instance, I was one of the, uh, I think one of the early adopters of the SIVA program. I hope you all use the SIVA program at home. Um, so I can get on my phone and using the HomeView app, I can tell you exactly how many kilowatt hours I've used today. Uh, it's a great uh, tool and I've made a lot of use of it. So um, you don't hear me say these things a lot because you know our time up here is very precious. We get a few minutes and there's so much to say and so sometimes it goes by the wayside. But I do wanna say um, I'm sorry if it seems like I'm not aware or recognizing the good things that the city is doing, I certainly am, okay? Um, with that out of the way, uh, I heard several things from the dais last week which I can't let go without a response. There were things that were said about us, about the Glendale Environmental Coalition that I think were dismissive and frankly insulting to a large number of people. Um, first, it was suggested that the crowd that turned up last week was somehow a bunch of people bust in from far and wide who don't really reflect the Glendale community. The implication was that you know, they shouldn't be telling us what to do and what they said doesn't really matter. Um, so let me correct the record on that. We estimate conservatively that 500 people came here last week, those opposed to the Grayson Project. I'm not including the union folks that came. Um, we had a sign-up sheet, and this is how we know this. We had a sign-up sheet downstairs. People were signing in. And on that sheet, we collected 420 names and where the people are from. They put their city of residence. We know a lot more people directed directly into the overflow room. So there were a lot more than 420, but we got 420 names. I looked over those names and I, and I made a list of where the people were from. And 60% roughly are from right here in Glendale. That's something like 300 Glendale residents physically making their way to council on a Tuesday evening. I don't think that's something that council should wave its hand at and disregard. And I don't think those people are too impressed when they get written off like that. Um, all right, and the point about some people being from Sacramento I thought was unnecessary. We had one expert come down from Sacramento, as you know, and by the way, he had a lot to say that would, the council would have benefited from. Unfortunately, he had only five or six minutes to speak. But anyway, let's move on. It was suggested that we want to deep six the EIR. I think that's a bit of an exaggeration. <coughs> what we've been saying is we want to pause. The work that's been done does not go in the trash can. And I think we've been very, very clear about that. We suggested pausing because the EIR is fundamentally flawed. It's asking an outdated question. It's asking what the best gas solution is to replace Grayson. It's not asking what's the best energy solution to replace Grayson. This is clear from the way we went out to find the consultants. The criteria that we established was experience with gas fire generation technology. We did not seek out people who know zero carbon alternatives. That was how the RFP was put together, at least according to the staff report. So forget the conflict of interest issue for now, although I think it's an important issue. But let's forget that for now. The fact is that we looked for people specifically to give us a gas solution, so we should not be surprised that they gave us a gas solution. They compared that sol solution to a few oversimplified alternatives, but they are not expert in the alternatives. This is the crux of the problem. This is why we see little point spending additional time and money completing the EIR. But okay, it's virtually finished, and you want it to be presented to the public, and I get that, that's a fair point, I have no problem. Having said that, we should not be wasting precious time and sitting on our hands until March 
to start investigating alternatives. At this point, we do not know the true extent to which we can meet our needs without combusting fossil fuels. We need to find that out. We need to find that out as quickly as possible. I believe it behooves the council to get that started sooner rather than later. To be continued, thank you. Thank you. James St. Alban, followed by Bill Wiseman. Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, uh, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, Dan was a, was a nice, uh, was a good, good, good cop. I'm going to be the bad cop. You know, Councilman and Jerry, and I thought your comments last week were ill informed, misguided, and ultimately condescending and disrespectful to the citizens of Glendale, like myself, who mm -hmm. want a hydrocarbon free energy source for our city. We realize reliability is an issue and we're not, we don't look to compromise reliability. I want to start with a, uh, go into my comments here. I want to address the question of GWP's plans to sell excess power to other utilities, which still seems to be an area of contention. In last week's staff report, GWP said that the quote, the project does not rely on or contemplate any sales of excess power other than uh, to other entities, unquote. Mr. Zern was very emphatic about this in his oral arguments. But there's a problem here. The problem is that the claim is inconsistent without the, with, with how the 250 megawatt option was initially conceived. It also can't be reconciled with the claim that the utility rates won't go up as a result of the project. Let's first look at the history. The integrated resource plan that GWP put together in 2015 said quite que clearly that the 250 megawatt proposal was, quote, relies heavily on market sales, unquote. Not just market sales, uh, not just that market sales are a possible option that could be considered, but they are market sales that are necessary for the project to be penciled out. I went back to, to clips from some of the older council meetings to find out more. And one consul a consultant recommended that GWF find buyers up front to enter into power purchase agreements to take off excess power. In another, a different consultant said that, and again, I'll quote here, quote, you only need about 200 megawatts to actually meet your load requirements. The others would be sold down, unquote. And I found that staff report from August 2014, and I found another staff report from 2014, which talks about the cost of the bonds to pay down the, for the, pay for the project. In that document, GWP says, again, I'll quote, a repower Grayson should create opportunities for new off-system revenues which would mitigate any rate impact caused by the debt service of, on the bonds, unquote. The thought that process is pretty clear uh, when you look at all this. The idea was to build a big plant which can serve as a giant insurance policy against transmission lines going down but because it would be so expensive, the only way to keep rates from skyrocketing would be to sell excess power that it throws off. Or maybe it was over, uh, oversized because it looked like a good revenue generator for the city. Whatever the motivation, the problem is that between that then and now, the market has changed. It is no longer possible to reliably sell excess gas power. I'm curious to what extent GWP followed the advice of its consultants and looked for buyers but came up short. In any case, once they were challenged uh, on this point, they changed their story. Now they say they're no longer contemplating selling power. But then how do they keep rates low? The whole thing strains credulity. I'm happy to compile a dossier of statements and clips documenting the changing narrative if council wishes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bill Wiseman, that's my last, last card for tonight. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, city staff, and the public. My name is Bill Weissman from Far North Glendale. I uh, wasn't planning on speaking tonight, but uh, I heard some things that I felt needed to be uh, addressed from uh, another speaker. First of all, I'd like to let you know that there are a number of people in Far North Glendale who like the monument signs. There are a number of people in Far North Glendale who have thanked Sharon and I for our work with the city in helping to uh, get the signs installed. Um, if you look on social media, Facebook and nextdoor.com, 
you don't see a whole lot of that side of the discussion because the people who are in favor and who like the signs are typically shouted down, insulted, denigrated, um, and a few of them I give a lot of credit for because they've hung in there and continued to you know, feel free to state their opinion. Um, I hear a lot of uh, hatred and nastiness directed at the city of Glendale, and this really disturbs me because I think our staff and our elected officials uh, are all working together to make this a place where uh, all of us citizens would like to live. And uh, there was a comment uh, the other day, for example, in, in one of the threads discussing the monument signs, and it said, we need to keep the stink of Glendale out of 91214. And that kind of thing really disturbs me, as well as many of the other hateful comments, bigoted comments. And I think that represents only a small minority of people who uh, are against the signs for whatever reason. But the thing that disappoints me the most is the fact that nobody else speaks up to uh, contradict and to uh, uh, confront uh, some of these issues. Um, we're retired, we don't need to be uh, concerned with you know, keeping a job or, or a business, and to, to some extent we've been uh, absorbing the public outcry. Um, and we want to thank the city for their help, for their patience, and to request again, please, get the monument signs finished as soon as possible and uh, put this whole thing to bed. Uh, one of the other things that was mentioned tonight was the issue of liability. This is something that keeps coming up on social media. People keep saying things like, well, don't they know they're going to get sued when somebody runs into those? Well, as a matter of fact, it's the other way around. The guy that ran into one monument, I believe, is going to be held responsible. I don't know if a lawsuit will be necessary, but will be held responsible uh, by the city for uh, the, the destruction of that particular piece of public property. And it really puzzles me because the last time people were here, um, and there were a few speakers that talked about possible safety issues regarding the signs. Uh, I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, the city attorney is sitting here. The deputy city attorney also happened to be here uh, that evening, a couple weeks ago. Uh, we have two of our city council members who are attorneys, and I have yet to hear any one of those four attorneys express any concerns or possible issues regarding liability. And it just happens to be my personal opinion based on my experience in, in Glendale, not just with Mr. Garcia, but city attorneys are among some of the most risk averse creatures in the known universe. And I would think if there were any kind of potential liability issue here, the city would be on top of it. And I don't see that happening. And uh, I really, really wish I don't have to come up here again to talk about this because it's ridiculous that we should be wasting any time on this when we face important <coughs> issues like grace and repowering, like Proposition 64, like spending the money in our public art fund, and so many other issues that should be uh, concerning this uh, body without uh, spending any more time on uh, the, the anti-sign nonsense. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. What's next, please? No business? No new business? Okay. Is there a second? To adjourn. Somebody has a second? We are adjourned.